you really believe that becoming a footballer is down to nature. You, you know, you just suddenly can't say, I want, I'm want. i going to be a footballer because your dad wants you to be a footballer. Let him get on with it, you know, let him play. If he's good enough, he'll come through. Most parents haven't got a clue about football and they suddenly want to start shouting and screaming at their kids. You have to work hard. You can have all the talent in the world. If you don't work hard, I can assure you 1 million percent you will not make it as a footballer. If you're taking your kid to go to a one-to-one -one training and he's sitting in the car and doesn't really want to go, you're in the wrong business. Save yourself the money. You can't make your kid love it. Do you think that football is less entertaining now, Harry? Yeah, I do, yeah. Personally, I do, yeah. I keep seeing people just keep passing square, backwards square. I don't see anybody can pick the ball up and do something. Everything is stacked, stacked, stacked. I know Michael Owen really well. I've never seen anyone quicker. But we used to say to Michael, Let, let's work on a bit of technique. What do I work on that for? I'll just stick it in the onion bag. So keepy ups, never want to do. Could do 20 keepy ups. So the game will never change. You'll have two dribblers in a football team when you get to 11 v 11, if you're lucky. After that, you've got to be out yeah. pass and move. <laughs>
you know, you, you played, you know, when you were six and all that, you were playing and you just always had a football. That's what you wanted to do, you know? Well, well that's so, what I just uh, want to touch on there, Harry, because in your book, Jamie, The Making of a Footballer, you describe when you were four years old, one of your earliest memories, there was footballs everywhere, like all over the house, all in the garden. I mean, that is an environment that's going to facilitate a lot of practice. Yeah, I guess so. And I always remember, there was one football, I remember the, what, the MLS ball used to have the stars on it. And I remember that dad, some you got one, you, I think after a game and you bought it back. And that was always the ball that I took everywhere, you know. And there's every picture I had, say, even with Mark, who liked football. He liked it. I loved it. That was probably the difference. There was never a picture without me with a ball in my hand. And I'm, I guarantee you were the same, Merce. Mm. Yeah, it's no, just 100%. what you did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like every time, the amount of times mum would go, put that ball down. And, and I could see Dad was looking at me, no, you keep playing. You know what mm. I mean? Just mess around with a ball and touching it and having it. You know, even if it's in your hands, it's just you become like as, uh, as one with it, you know. And I think that was something that, I certainly love, but I also had a probably a unique upbringing where some days dad would be taking me to training and I, uh, or taking me to school and I'd go, dad, can I come training? And he'd go, wow, all right, come on in. And we'd go to training, like, mm. and I'd go and join in with the first team at 11, mm. 12, which probably, you know, I don't think my headmaster was too happy with, but <laughs> it worked out, didn't it? <laughs> Well, yeah, mum didn't. Your mum didn't know until you couldn't read or write when you were fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> realised realize something had been going on. But uh, no, I used to used to come in training with me and always be around footballers. I suppose that was obviously a big advantage for you. And but, something um, about the relationship between you and Jamie, I got the impression from the book that Jamie idolised you. He really looked up to you. And I see that with a lot of players that go on to be successful. They have a strong relationship, often with the father. And with you being a football manager, being a player, do you think that had an impact on Jamie? Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. I mean, without a doubt. And he spent, as I say, spent his whole, you know, childhood really being around footballers, whether it was in America, whether it was at Bournemouth when I was managing all them years, 10 years there coming in training every day or every other, you know, just being around a football club. And that's what he wanted to do. Mm. But you have to have the ability to do it, wanting to do it and being able to do it are two different things, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, so you've got, to, you've got to have that ability. You can't, you can't just suddenly make somebody, you know, who, who, who teaches you, who taught Mercer how to play, who taught him how to play a ball outside of his foot, who... Teaches Joe Cole, who, whose dad, you know, said he'd never kicked the football in his life. You know, George, he, he, and Joe was a genius, you know, with a foot, with best schoolboy player I'd ever seen, 11 years of age. He was a, unbelievable. But, you know, George, he, I used to speak to his dad, he said, no, he had no interest in football at school. And so, but Joe had this talent that was. So where did it come from? It's difficult. It wasn't drummed into him by his dad, that's for sure. Mm. Here's one for your dad. So obviously we're a pretty unique family in the, in the fact that Frank Lampard played for England as well and Frank Senior. So four of us to have that sort of a career is pretty unusual. But do you think Frank was as it, it, as close to nurture as nature? Because in terms of like getting pushed and, and having... He, Frank was a good, good young player, but he wasn't necessarily on a red carpet playing for England schoolboys, things like that. He got pushed. He had to get pushed to a certain extent. Would you agree with that? Well, he pushed himself, though, Fred, Jamie. He had he had an incredible attitude that he that he obviously got from his dad. But his dad, you know, he would train. He'd be out in that training ground at four o'clock in the afternoon when it was getting dark in the middle of winter, with his spikes on. People said he couldn't get round a pitch. He can't run. How's he ever going to be a player? Every day he'd run, he'd have his, do his sprints, he'd go run, do laps. He just got fitter, trained, practised. But he was he was driven. But, you know, his dad had that same drive as a player when he was young. And obviously Frank had that as well. So that's but, really what, what made him, you know. He, he was a good schoolboy player, but he went to a, a, probably a public school, whatever, Brentwood, whatever it called, public school, private school. Um, so he didn't come through the normal footballing route that kids go come from, you know. 
in that respect. But he he he, he had that drive. He just wanted to be wanted to be a player. Nothing was going to stop him. He practiced and practiced and practiced. Yeah, but Harry, like it, I, it went like you always see the. Um the uh, interview when you done the press conference when someone questioned Frank yeah. at West Ham and you like I, you saying he's a proper player and all that. If you weren't the manager, do you think he'd have got that chance with someone else? Do you know what I mean? Because you, you know football and you've seen football, but other, <clears throat> you stuck by him and he's, in, from my, in my opinion, he's turned out to be one of the greatest Premier League players of all time because in my yeah. opinion, no one's ever going to put up the figures he put up ever again. 20 goals a season from yeah. midfield. So mm. do you think you, the way you like football and the way you see it in your vision, do you think because of you, if you wasn't the manager, you think he would have been let go or not got given that opportunity? Uh, no, I think, I don't think he'd have been let go, Merz. I think that's, um, I think once he came into the club, before he came in, people were like, well, you know, I had people who worked at the club, worked for me, who said, we can't get round the pitch, you know, is he ever going to be a player? But he just, he just went out there and trained and worked and run and practiced. It, it was never a day he wouldn't be out on that training ground when it was getting dark on his own with a bag of balls and doing his sprints. He just wanted to be a player. So, but yeah, no, he broke in early. I loaned him out when he was sort of 17 to Swansea and he went down to Swansea, he played at the old bench, ankle deep mud. And done well there. Uh, and then he came back and then he's sort of 18, 19, he's in the first team. So no, I think he'd have always he had that attitude. I wouldn't I couldn't sit there and say it was because of me. I think um it, it was because of him. And his dad obviously is, was well, his dad had that attitude about him that he he just wanted to be a player, you know, wanted to would he trained the same as Frank. He was an incredible trainer and, and worked at his game. So it was obviously in the blood for him. Yeah, well, he that's what I, I wanted to just ask there, Harry. Could you describe the different parenting styles between the way that you brought up Jamie from a football point of view and the way that Frank Senior brought up Frank Lampard? Uh, yeah, I would think Frank was uh, Frank would push young Frank. He'd make him, he would, you know, but the kid had it in him as well. But he would, he would demand a lot of him and he'd push him and... You know, he'd ruck him practice if he didn't do whatever. He, he was quite hard on him, I think, in, in football, you know, in terms of his football. Yeah. Um, and he'd get him working, get him doing stuff. Can you... uh, whereas I didn't have to do that with Jamie. I just mm. let him play. I'll go and watch him stand out of the way. Never, never shouted or screamed. Or I'm not saying Frank shouted or screamed, but he would, he would certainly, he, he would, he'd be quite hard with Frank because that's how Frank was Frank Senior was an incredible trainer mm. he'd been the best I'd ever seen up until young Frank come along the pair of them were just quite unique I'd never seen two people train or work as hard Frank Senior had the same thing at 17 Ron Greenwood was going to let him go to Torquay on loan and Frank said I don't want to go to Torquay I want to play for West Ham what's wrong with me he was 18 I think at the time he said well he's Frank you know he said well tell me what's wrong with me and I'll work on it I, I want to play for West Ham I don't want to go to Torquay uh, and he said, well, your you, you pace rank and what Frank got a set of spikes every day he'd come in, every day today he finished playing, he did his sprints 10 yards, little sharp ones, jockey, twist and turn go for 10, 15 yards sharp sprints, did that every day, worked at it, chipping balls you know, he's getting balls out of his feet and clipping balls, and young Frank done it, was exactly the same, every day with the spikes, Frank bleeding the spikes, he, they made him quicker and they did Frank Senior. So when people say you can't get quick, I've seen it. I saw Frank Senior, who couldn't run, become a play for West Ham for 20 years at fullback. Am I and right? Get in, quicker and quicker. Am I right and in young saying Frank was exactly the same? Sorry, Dad. Am I right in saying that um, with Frank Senior as well, it, I, they, they realised he probably couldn't play right back because there was someone in his position. So he went and learned how to become a great left back and worked on his left foot because he was he was predominantly he was a right footed player. Yeah, but he work on everything, Jamie. Just every day he'd, he'd, he'd train, and you know he'd be out there on his own, and you know, and you know what it's like when he first started doing that when he was about seventeen. The other young players would look at, oh, look at, you know, look at him. He's trying to, 
but he didn't give a monkeys about anybody. He was so he had this determination about him that I'm going to be a player. Nothing's going to stop me. I don't care. I'll show the manager he's wrong. Want it to loan me out to Torquay or let me go to Torquay permanently, possibly. I'm going to prove him wrong. And that's what he did. And he did genuinely, he put yards of pace. He just was so slow, it was scary. And then suddenly he got quicker and quicker. He was a good sportsman, don't get me wrong. He was a fantastic cricketer, played for the England cricket schools team. Um, and he had a hard upbringing, but he had a determination about him that I'd never, that was incredible, really. And, you know, I remember him playing the practice match when he was 17, 18, and Peter Braybrook, who was one of my favourite, Peter played for England, played for Chelsea, came to West Ham, and Peter had unbelievable ability. And he's gone to, he's trying to beat, you know, Frank was playing left back in a practice match, and he kicked Peter six foot in the air, and Brada looked, Peter looked at him and said, Oi, what are you doing? Looked up at him, and Frank said, You if you take the mic, try to take the mickey again, I'll kick you twice as hard next time. <laughs> yeah. And that was like an 18 year old kid, but that's how he was. He mm-hmm. didn't give a nothing was going to stop him. And young Frank had that. You know, you think of the abuse he got at West Ham mm-hmm. when he was coming on. Oh, he's only playing because he's your grand, you know, your nephew, and he's up because his dad's your assistant. It was all that, all that. Yeah, he was still scoring goals at West Ham. He, you know, I know he didn't go to Chelsea, but it was. You know, twelve million quid because he was he was my nephew. He went there because Chelsea saw something in him that you know that was an amazing signing. I think Ken Bates was very instrumental in taking him to Chelsea at the time. Uh, but what a career he had! But yeah, mm. he was so determined to to succeed that nothing was going to stop him. And he, if anyone got in his way, you that... know, and they say he suffered all that. He was so strong. He overcome that abuse and everything else that he'd got at times. He just he'd come on and get on with it. Nothing would nothing would knock him down. Dad, this is Project Footballer, right? So a parent comes up to you, got a really precocious talent, six, seven years of age. What advice would you give him? Uh, I would give him let him play. Go and watch him play. Stand out of the way. Don't interfere. Don't shout and scream at the kid. Let him enjoy his football. Give him little bits of advice if you, you know, occasionally, but don't take the, the fun out of it for him. Um, and let him get on with it, you know, let him play. If he's good enough, he'll come through. But then, if he's not. Sorry, just to play devil's advocate, that does conflict with what Frank Lampard Sr. did with Frank Lampard. Yeah, but he was different. He was, he was a, Frank Sr. was a top player. Most parents haven't got a clue about football. And they suddenly want to start shouting and screaming at their kids. Frank didn't shout or scream at him, but he would make him work. He would, he would push him to do stuff, you know, and he'd take him out in the garden probably and work with him and do stuff like that with him. He did um, shout at him. I saw Frank Senior shout at him at times oh, when he was 11, 12 years of age. But not in yeah, like, maybe. only in a, in, a, in a way that's like, oi, come on, you've got to run. You've got to chase. Yeah. Like that was, so I, 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 I've seen it from you know, my own eyes. He, Frank yeah. Senior used to shout at his boy when he played, but not, I don't swear at him or yeah. anything, but he was shouting. No. Like my dad he's, never. He said that in a lot of his interviews. Yeah, Frank Frank's Lampard. mentioned it. Yeah, like yeah. Dad, I remember once dad telling me, I played in the game mm. at Bournemouth Stadium, funny enough, and I played, I, don't, I remember the kid's name, Danny Allsop played in midfield against me. And he, I think he's a year older and he got the better of me that day. And I the only time dad ever, he said to me, that boy a day got the better of you. That, that, that if you want to be a footballer, that can't happen. You know, you've got to make sure you match him and you run. And it always stuck in my mind. I remember playing against him the following year. That was probably the only time I ever think, well, God, that was something that dad told me. He almost not, and that was his way of almost telling me off. Mm. But for some parents, like Frank Senior, would push mm. and shout and get something out of him. But if you said to Frank now, did that help you become a footballer? Absolutely. Mm. Without that, Absolutely. without getting pushed. So, you know, making him run and making him go on runs. It, there are two schools <laughs> of thought on it. Paul, what's your opinion but, you on know, this? What I was... in football as well, though, James, because, you know, people go, oh, it's because it was. It, Frank became an incredible player. Not, you know, but people always go, oh, well, you know, you, you did it, you got a chance. You got. There's other people, you know, I've seen players, Kevin Bond, who, you know, his dad John played at West Ham for 20 years as well. And Kevin is a schoolboy player. You wouldn't have given a, a shilling for his chances of being a player. He came to Bournemouth as a kid, as an apprentice, and everybody went, how can he, you know, he, he was so average. He wasn't average. He was a million miles below average. Couldn't run, couldn't. 
But he ended up having a fantastic career. He was player of the year at Man City one year, player of the year at Southampton, um, and played for a long, long time. But mm. he had a determination to make it. But people always say, oh, it was because of his dad. He, you know, he, he might have got the chance in the first place because of his dad. He probably did. But then from then on, it's even harder, I think, when, you, when you're involved with your father because people always want to knock you. People always, like Frank mm. did at West Ham, the best thing he did was get away and go off to Chelsea and play off and do it off his, you know, so no one could point a finger at him and say, oh, you're only getting picked because your dad or then he just had an incredible career off his own back. So I think it is harder when you've got a son or someone and you try to, it must have been hard for Nigel Clough, really, with playing with his dad. Mm. Uh, uh, not Forest, you know, for Brian Club. Parents, I think you're better off if you've got a kid, get them away. You don't want them at your club. Let them go somewhere else and play and prove what they can do off their own back. I think when you, you have them and you're the manager, I think you're really putting yourself in a very difficult position. Mum used to give you some terrible stick when you didn't play me, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cup of tea. <laughs> just, just on the my parenting styles the there. Buy me a cup of tea. <laughs> just, my just as I'm doing a Zoom here, Mo. <laughs> I'm just gonna beat them at golf in a minute. I'm taking a cup of tea. Off we, we, we need a little bit more of your time, please, Harry. Um, no problem. Just on the parenting styles, so I think that's a really, really interesting subject and a tough balance for parents to get right. But Paul, for your nine-year-old boy. Hey. Eight-year-old, what's the balance that you find with hard sometimes? Hard sometimes. I because I, I I try I try to be like Harry. I I do try to be like Harry. Let him play. Get him on with it. You know, I do I do want him to do that and enjoy his football. Sometimes <clears> I will pull him up. Sometimes I feel, uh, yeah. It is hard sometimes. I'd never have a go at him. I'd never go, but I would go like, oh, you didn't get the better of him. He's got the better of you. You can't keep on letting that happen. I do say that. But the only thing I ever say to him before a game on a Sunday or even training, there's only one thing you're in control of, working hard. Work hard. And I think in everything that Harry said there and Jamie said, and I think a lot of the parents miss this out, you have to work hard. You can have all the talent in the world. If you don't work hard, I can assure you one million percent you would not make it as a footballer. I can assure you of that. You that it, all, for all the talent you have, you have to come back to one thing: work hard. The best player probably ever to play football was Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi worked as hard as anybody. When he was at Barcelona playing his playing the five second press, he led from the front. He was the one that started it all. He got the ball back. Mm. Him and Indiesta and Xavi, people go, oh, unbelievable players, unbelievable player but they worked hard. That's the one thing I say with Freddie. If he doesn't work hard, which isn't very often, no. that's the one thing I would pull him up on. He is a very, very hardworking kid. And with your other boys that have played football, how does Freddie compare to them, not ability-wise, but love of football and work rate? Yeah, uh, better. Really? Yeah, the, the, the oldest one would work hard, but he didn't have as much talent as the other two. The middle one worked really hard, but didn't have the talent of the, 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 the youngest boy bar Freddie, Sam had all the talent, but didn't have Freddie's work rate. Mm. He didn't have Freddie's work rate. And if you ain't got that. Cause that was one it. thing I took from your book, Jamie, one of the differences between you and your brother, Mark, it just seemed mm. that, yeah, you just became obsessed with football. And that was a difference between you and Mark. Yeah, I, I had a very obsessive behaviour. I think, you know, we've got quite a bit of addiction in our family. <laughs> <laughs> but we, when it comes to, to going in the garden and we, when we moved to a house, my, my granddad, it's been well said before, but we, he, he was a carpenter, my, my mum's dad. And he, he built like a bird cage in the garden. And I couldn't, I couldn't go in for dinner unless I'd hit it five times. We had a nice size guy, and we were lucky. Dad was starting to do, you know, okay as a manager. And I said to clip balls, clip balls, and until I hit it five times on the top of top of it, then I could go for dinner. Mum would be shouting at me. I wouldn't go in. I couldn't. You know, it didn't matter how dark it got. And I think that was why I became certainly a good passer. I could pick someone out from any distance, and you know, we were you know, on the run or whatever it was. Um, uh, having well, to that's get why to... you became so skinny. 
But even no, keeping... You didn't get any dinner. Uh, no. <laughs> even keeping the ball up, I'd have to do it a thousand times or whatever it took to just make sure that I got those touches of the ball. And, and, and you have to be an addict. You've got to want it so badly. Mm. And if you don't do that, yeah. I'm sorry. And, it, and that's where, like, in the, when you're taking your... If you're taking your kid to go to a one-to-one trainer and he's sitting in the car and doesn't really, really want to go... You're in the wrong business. Save yourself the money. Yeah. You know, they've got to be chomping a bit. They've got to get their boots out. The night before a game, I'd lay my kit out. I'd have my boots ready. They'd be clean. Right. That's how it has to be. You've got yeah. to love it. And if you don't, you can't make your kid love it. Right. You know, it's very difficult mm-hmm. to do that. True. Harry, you just made a remark there around Jamie's diet. Um, is that something you considered as he was developing as a player? Did you give him advice on that? No, no. I'm no? True cool, no. No, I didn't really. I, I mean, my I was always old school, wasn't I? You know, when I went when I went to Tottenham, they said that the players can't have ketchup and all that. I said, listen, it doesn't matter if they have ketchup or not. If they can't pass the ball to each other. Having ketchup ain't going to make a lot of difference. Listen, Merce, Merce, I'm sure Merce wasn't in the diets or all that. And, uh, he, you know... So, well, no, I, I, w- I wouldn't have been into that, really. Well, well that's a question for you, and it's something I want to talk on the episode. Do you think that football is less entertaining now, Harry? Yeah, I do, yeah. I, personally, I do, yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't see anyone... That, I, I watch games, and I get... I keep seeing people just keep passing square, backwards square. I don't see anybody can pick the ball up and do something, play a you know, beat somebody or open a door, even watching the other night while I'm watching Chelsea. How are they ever going to break Newcastle down? They got No one can do anything. It's only maybe Sterling might have a little run and play a one, two or two. I couldn't see any anyone to do it. And I, I see so many games like that now where we, we, have a, we used to produce so many great dribblers, people that could dribble. Every team had wingers that could dribble, people that could do special things. You know, Merce could do it. He played with people like Thierry Henry and then there was Dennis Bird, Cap. people that could do something fantastic. And, you know, I don't see there's that many around now in the game. I think we've got lots of people now that we keep you know, backwards square, we keep the ball. There's all you hear coaches shouting out now to the kids, it's pass, pass, pass. I want to see them shout dribble, dribble, dribble. I want to see people that can beat someone and do something and turn a game for you because open the game up when it's tight. There's less and less people about players coming in, I think, now who can do who can do something different. Yeah. I do find the game quite at times quite tedious, yeah. Liverpool, Man United last week, big mm. build up. What nothing happens. I'd be a shot of <laughs> one or two shots at goal. No, it, we get that, uh, but you know, there are exciting games. There's also a lot of games that are not so exciting. I think back in the day there was a lot more exciting, exciting open open football matches. Do you think that is Harry as well? Because of like the way people play now and the shape they play. And before, you know, when we played, it was pretty much four four two, two out and out wingers. Everybody yeah. knew their job. That winger got yeah. the ball, beat players, two up front, bending runs, two in midfield, yeah. got up and down. Now, sometimes I find players come onto a pitch, and I don't really think they know what they're. Job is, if I'm being honest, they don't know yeah. whether to stick or twist. Yeah, I think too much go. You know, everything now is about. You know, it's all about shape and it's all about systems and it's. You know, everybody's it got to be in the right slots. It's you know, it's a lot of jargon and all the isn't there? It's all the year now. It's just all the jargon, all the new as though the game's just been invented. You know, <laughs> um, but no, it, it, there is. You know, there is not enough people about for me who get me off my seat. I want to see people do something uh, and play a pass. That, you know, oh, my God, how do you, where do you see that pass from, you know? Or beat someone and do something. I love to see people that can do stuff like that. That's why I've always had people. You know, when I was a manager, I always signed people. People say, oh, they're mavericks. But they had great ability. I took Mercy, changed Portsmouth for me. I took the Canio when nobody would touch him because he was a genius, you know, and he had great ability. I love them. I love them type of players. I think, you know, people that can do something special. I was talking to Lee Trundle yesterday, Harry, and he yeah. said for you as a manager, he said that you always set your teams up to entertain. I mean, obviously you were successful and, you know, you, you're a super yeah. successful manager, but did you also have an intention that you wanted to entertain the fans? 
Yeah, oh, you, I wanted to have a go, yeah. I mean, you know, when I went to Tottenham, I played with two wingers, home and away, every never change, really. Aaron Lennon on one side, Gareth Bale on the other. And we got it out to them and, uh, you know, one against one. If one of them couldn't have a good day against the full-back, the chances are the other one would. And, and I love playing that way. I love, you know, I love people. That, and then, you know, of course, if we play with three at the back and I played Merce, I played him spare in behind the front, you know, too. And he would, he could, I let him play really, let him play where he wanted to play, get on the ball, make something happen. Uh, Old Berkowitz, I did that with him at uh, West Ham. Just keep, I'll just keep getting on the ball and make things happen for us, you know. I love people with ability. And uh, so, yeah, I think my teams, that's how I wanted to play, really. You don't see that anymore, though, do you? You don't see people just being given a free role anymore, like just go out and go and play. It's everybody's in a system, <laughs> no. you know. Yeah. No one runs out of position. No one, you know. I was at Chelsea the other night. You know, St Sterling was on one wing, uh, Palmer was Palmer was on the other one. No one ended up on the, you know, Sterling didn't come and end up on the side I was sitting. Do you know what I mean? He never made a run across, and the other lad just dropped in. It was. It was like Sabutio football. It was like everybody's working on their stats. Like you've got to be at 85%, 90% of keeping the ball. If it's down at 60, you're not going to play the following week. But I you know. might have had yeah, that. That 40% passes might have been five of them might have been through the eye of a needle. How would you have found it now? If you, when you look at the way the modern game's gone, where mm. would you have found yourself playing or where do you see yourself? Because you, Dad, when Dad talks about Mavericks, yeah. I played against you enough. I used to hate playing against you. She had so much ability. You know, that outside of the right foot and shots and goals. Where would you have played, do you think, now? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because you were a maverick. You used to, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, when I first started off as a kid, I was centre forward and then I went right wing. And then as my career, got, as I got older, I think you, you earned that thing of playing in that position. It's very rare you get a 20-year-old playing in the pocket. But the, the brain I don't know. Yeah, I would probably... I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I think the the thing is, when I played, I ain't going back. Oh, when we played, because the game hasn't changed. You know, it hasn't. All that's changed are the pitches, and it probably got quicker because of the pitches. That's the only reason, because you can pass it a lot quicker now. I don't see people run without the ball anymore. And my job was, when I got the ball, I relied on people to run when I had the ball. I don't see people running without the ball anymore. I think that that art's gone. I don't, you know, I see the other day at Chelsea. It's different when you're at the game because you can see the old thing. You know, I when, like, Fernandez got the ball in the first 20 minutes or someone, no one makes a run. No one, you know, the only person I've ever seen, the best person I've seen make runs without the ball, two people, is, is Harland, who don't get it enough, and Salah. And, and you know... They're the ones with the two figures that go through the roof with their stats because they're prepared to run without the ball. I don't see that, you know, and I'm a great believer and I've always, wherever I play, I've always been around good players. Stick around good players. If you ain't got good players around you, mm. you know, it's vice versa with managers, I think Harry would be the same. You know, Pep Guardiola's not taking Rochdale through the leagues to the Premier League, believe me. Mm. You, no. you know, it, you, it works either good way. Players. Good players... Got to be round good players and good ma manage. Good managers have good players. If we've got a little bit more time, Harry, I would just like to read to you a quote from Michael Owen. I don't know if you saw it. He went kind of viral recently for what he said on this subject. So I'll just read this. There was more pure footballers back in the day. Now you have to be an athlete. You just have to be able to run. You have to be big. You have to be fast. You have to be covering X amount of kilometers now. You don't even have to be that good anymore. Back in the day, you had to have real skill and top attributes to be a top footballer. There's loads of great players that are absolute ballers, proper, proper talented. Now, if you run a bit further than anyone else, you are basically pass it from A to B, then you're getting a decent career in the Premier League. Yes, I agree with him. Yeah, I agree with him. I would agree. I mean, you know, when we look back, you know, you people now... The, you know, even the great Leeds team that had two mid central midfield players, both five foot six, you know, Bremner and Giles. You know, you you had people now you've got to be an athlete. I think now it's all about, yeah, stats and running, as Merce said, the passing. Everything is stats, stats, stats. You know, where would the 
the, you know, the Jimmy Greaves is of this world and all these f incredible players over the years. People have looked at and said, well, he's not an athlete or he's not. I, I agree. I think that uh, there's less and less people, you know, uh, getting through with, with real good ability now. And we're going more for the athletic type of, of player, really. And you can make a good living if you can run and if you can pass it simple. You know, we see we see midfield players going for ninety hundred million pounds. The boy at Chelsea, you know, he don't score, he don't make goals, he breaks up play, plays it simple. Suddenly, he's under a million pound football. It's incredible. The only one I picked you up on, Dad, and I remember having a conversation with you because when you went to Tottenham, you said, "I've got, I've got a player. You know, I've played this guy." And you said, "I need." He plays off the left hand side. But I think I want to get him in central. But I just wonder if he's strong enough. And he had a decent career. He's not done too bad, Luka Modric. Mm. But you, yeah. you were, you were like, can he handle the physicality? You know. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to play him in there. I mean, obviously now the rest is history because you, you almost changed it for him. You know what I mean? Changed it for yourself because he was so important. But there, if you've got that ability, it doesn't matter what size you are. If you've got that fight in you, you can certainly do what Absolutely. he's done. Absolutely, of course you can. Absolutely, if you've got that ability. It's, you know, there's a, there's a spring up there, a sky up there. What is it? It's not the size of the dog in it's the fight. It's the size of, it's the fight in the dog, is it? Or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, it's dumb how big you are. If you've got ability, you haven't got to be, you shouldn't have to be six foot one, six foot two and be out of run all day. You know. Good, you've got, you've got to have a football brain. Football but, brain, people with ability who can play, you know. But that is, still, a, that is well, the way though. And then, look, it, Talk about Messi. Look at the side. If you looked at him, probably you'd have gone like, "Yeah." But he's got funny little feet. You know, he might have mm. walked in your club. You thought, "Nah, look at him. He can't make it." You mm. know. But that's the way it is, though. Now, isn't it? You know, it's all size, size, size. First thing they look at: parents. How big is a parent? Yeah. How big is that parent? How big is that parent? You know, know. You know, even now. But you look at some of the top players, like Carl Walker's one of the best defenders. You know, I wouldn't like to play against Carl Walker. He's electric, quick, no. but. If you had to pick one player that would probably give him the biggest run around in the Premier League, it would probably be Bernard Silva, his, his team. Because he would have him coming yeah. out into positions he wouldn't want to come out into. And because he's intelligent, he's a footballer and not the biggest, but he's got a football brain. You know, I don't know if yeah. the football brain carries 100%. a lot now. Well, Do you my, know what I mean? My, Michael, so I've, I've, I know Michael Owen really well, talking about that quote there. So when Michael first came into this on the scene... He's he's a great lad. He he, but he, this this young man was talking. He was on like eleven, twelve. We knew, you know. I was eighteen, nineteen at the time. I was in the first team. Every year, he could they bring him into the dressing room. So you were sort of accustomed to this young yeah. man. They were looking after him. Man United wanted him. Everyone, but he he like he wanted to come to Liverpool. And fifteen, sixteen, he was training with the first team. And he obviously think he made his debut sixteen, seventeen. I've never seen anyone quicker. Mm. never seen anyone mm. quicker in my life he was so fast made great runs but we used to say Michael let, let's work on a bit of technique technique stuff he went what do I work on that for I'll just stick it in the onion bag mm. I'm like no no you, we've got to look we've got to work on your technique and do little bits you know keepy ups never want to do couldn't do 20 keepy ups so when he actually got his injuries subsequently he needed to rely on something else because he lost that little bit of speed he became like almost, it became Crips night, but it became more like everybody else. So he had to find a different mm. way. And don't get me wrong, he had the football brain where he scored important goals. Remember the one he scored for United against Man City, the winning goal. He could still do it. But lot, losing that pace made him like, like more to it, made him like everybody else. Mm. So you've got to have, uh, if you've got that football brain as well, it makes such a difference, you know? Mm. And that's what gives you that edge mm. because it's not always about speed. Bernardo Silva tells you everything about that. The guy's five foot eight, five foot nine. But his football brain is so much quicker than anybody else's. You can't foul him. And especially the way the game is now, mm. you can't really, you know, you can't overpower people. You need, if you've got skill and, and you're fast and you manipulate the ball really well off your left and right foot, like Modric, like Bernardo mm. Silva, you can't get near everybody. Like, if you look at Bellingham, Bellingham is probably the, the, you know that film Weird Science when we were young? And you design yeah. a footballer. And you take, you know, the, girl, the, guy, the, the guys in the computer design the perfect girl. The, <laughs> that's what you've done with Jude Bellingham. Mm. You've designed the perfect mm. specimen. He's got an incredible football brain. He's got the perfect family environment with his mum and dad. He can run. He can score goals. He's got a finesse. He, he's like a wide man skill playing central midfield. That's what you want. But there are, there are others that you look at, like Dad said, that would come in the building. You go, well, oh, I wouldn't have him. He can't, he's too small. But you've got to give people time to develop and use that skill they have. 
with your with your boy being through the academy system from under A, and he was he's still in it now, isn't he? Mm. And so you've seen a lot of it. Does it make sense to you why football is like it is now, seeing academy football? Yeah, I I, I think if you can. I think getting kids to, to train so much, so hard at eight, nine years of age and not letting it be fun and almost getting into battles every every day against another kid, I'm not sure that's always healthy. You know, I, I think in Spain, they don't necessarily do that in producing players. Like There are elements to it that I love because we don't, we, we have, for whatever reason, it, 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 I, we can't produce, like Merster could do it, but receive the ball on the half turn, you know, and drive away from players. We struggle with midfield areas with that. Jude, oh, Jude can obviously do it. But there's not many. You can count on probably two hands that you go like, you know, Foden, I would like to see play deeper. Mm. But most of our players in this country, we haven't had any Esters and Javis and players like that that are comfortable with the, with the ball and two off two feet. But that is certainly changing. You know, we are producing I'll tell you young another players. slight problem, James. The problem is 80% of the young coaches who work at football clubs have never played football or don't play football. They're 24, 25, a lot of them. They don't play. They don't know. They've never been there. They've never been in that position. They've never seen that pass. They've never, they've never had the ups and downs of being a young footballer who wants to be a player. They don't play. They're academics. And academics are running the game at the moment at, at, at youth level. There's no doubt about it in my mind. I, I see them. I watch them. I listen to them. And I'm going, I ask them, why don't you? How old are you? I'm 24. Don't you, who'd you play? Don't you play? No, I don't play. But they all, they've all learnt the game on computers and, and studying the game, but they've never probably kicked the ball, isn't it? And it's very difficult when you're dealing with kids and you're trying to help them and you've never actually kicked the ball or played football at any level. It, 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 it's certainly more and more, it, you know, it's very it's very difficult. I think we need... Is the people, that, the ex-players have been frozen out of coaching at youth level now. It's all about, you know, stats and academics who can can put it down and sell themselves very well. But whether they're actually teaching the kids and that well, I'm not so sure. What do you think of that, Sean? Because that's obviously something that you do. James, well. I've got coach. to go. My man's what? on the team. Mo, he's on the team. I swear, and there's a four behind us. All right. We can Hope you win, this Harry. All right, Dad, this obviously Thank you so one, much for that. I want to say one last thing. I could have been a stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and, Jack, and Jack Whitehall's just texted me and said that he could have played for England, so you don't know anything. <laughs> Cheers, Harry. Okay, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Good luck. See you later. See you later. Bye, mate. Bye. Bye. Get your boys. Bye, See bye. See you, Dad. Bye. Oh, so windy, have you seen it? Yeah. Oh my that's God. So I, I'll ask you that quick. We can still, we can still, yeah. yeah. So, so that that that's an interesting question he's made there because you talk about, you know, Jose Mourinho will probably come in here and go, well, I didn't play. Look at my career as a manager or as a coach. Mm. Do you think that he's right by saying that you you've had to have played the game to be a good coach or certainly at youth level? I do. Look, I hadn't played professional, and when I started to go into Chelsea Academy as a coach. From the age of like 17, I started to see players, ex-players that were coaching like Jody Morris, Andy Myers. I think maybe Tor Andre Flo might have been about it. John Harley. Like I could see that the Eddie Newton, like I see that these people had played the game and they could give advice to the older players, the 15 year olds, 16 year olds that I couldn't give at that age, having never played professional, not even been at an academy. So I actually didn't try to, going down the route of coaching older players because I thought I would have given them a disservice. That was myself personally. So I've stayed around working with the pre-academy ages because I felt technically I was very good and I could understand the game from a technical point of view. And I could pass that on to the young kids. Mm. I, I do think that. I do think. And and what he's saying, yeah. yeah well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Right? Yeah, not, go on, we, we, go on. We've been, you, you coached my kids when yeah, they were younger. Yeah. If you couldn't have played, I wouldn't let you near my kids. No. Because I, if you've got a coach that's coaching your young kid and he can't clip a ball or no. if he can't keep the ball up or have basic skills or do a nice step over if he's trying to educate your kid. Yeah. 
quite you be- right. You, you can't you can't have that. No. You need to be out of shape. If you're demonstrating things or you've got to have an eye. Absolutely. You know, like I always, I always think, you know, you talk about someone, they, when they pass the ball, you go, oh, that's that's a different noise. Yeah. Or, you know, when they do a step over and it's fluid. Yeah. You know, you've got to be able to have had, because there's so many people mm. in the game that probably think, this is easy money. I can do a bit of coaching and stand there, tell them what to do. You need to be able to demonstrate it, you know, and especially you, you've got to make sure you do it in the right way and how they move off either foot, if they're on their toes when they're running or how they touch the ball, you know, play with the outside of your foot. I do think it's an important yeah, thing. Would you yeah. agree with that? Paul? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I think it is important. I, I think for, for that, I mean, I, there's the, the, Freddie's coach at Chelsea called Sampa. Oh, he's class. Very good. Like every time I've ever talked to him, all I could ever are, he sees what I see. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's all I could well. ask. I love Sam. Yeah, I like. I haven't had that. He's the only coach he's had him and Ross. And every time I've ever talked to him, I've always put the phone down and gone, "My God, he see what I see." Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I do see it. Di- I do see it differently. I do. I watch football differently to a lot of other people. You know, I see. You know, than other parents and even other people, but. Every time, you know, I might see something in a game and I might talk to them and they go, oh, what about when Freddie did that or he didn't do that? And I, I, I think, oh, my God, do you yeah. see what I see? And that's all you one, can ask. Do you one-on-one coach Freddie? No. Only, what, me? No, do you get someone else to do it? No. You just let him do academy? Yeah. Really? You, yeah, because yeah, I... You have I, done. I, I have done, but that was before he got into full-time academy. And I say full-time, where he's training Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturday, play Sunday. I think Freddie turns up at training with... Fair air and leaves training with black air, <laughs> so there's no need to do any more training, okay. in my opinion. He pushes, he, he works his socks off, he works hard, yeah. I, you know, and I might do some stuff how, in the garden. How gar- difficult is but it? But you Paul? do stuff extra stuff in the garden. I'll do, he's always in the garden, he's always in the so garden. We, we have two two goals, and he'll smash the ball in left foot, right foot. And we, we're lucky enough, we have a wall in the garden, which yeah. is Andy. A wall's great, isn't it? A wall's great. See, I think wall's the best thing. I yeah. think you can have all the stuff in the world, just keep on whacking the ball against the wall. Yeah. yeah you know, I think well. it's, in my opinion, I mean... How difficult is it, most? Because I remember, so my boys, so I drove Charlie away from football. He's now 19. He's a rugby player. Um, Bo is 15. But when you hear parents talking and they're going, yeah, yeah, I found this one-on-one coach or I'm doing this with him and he's got this tomorrow night. Is it not sometimes... Because you are you don't want to fall behind. It, does, it, does it scare you a little bit like that, that you're missing out? Or are you like, no, I've got a plan here. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I, 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 I like, Freddie's going to be a certain player. So there's no point going to a one-on coach and doing 20 hours of dribbling around a cone because he ain't going to be that player. So that, that's out the window. You know, He because he never started at a young age where some of these kids, some of their feet are at training and mind blowing. But Freddie's a passer. He sees a pass and he plays a certain way and he looks around and he's got to keep on playing that way. So the only person who's going to teach him that bar the coaches at Chelsea is me. If I take him to a one-on-one coach, they're going to teach him something different bar at, at gem football There's a place called gem football, which is perfect for Freddie. You know, it's off the boards and it's turning you, you, and it's, I think that's priceless. But I wouldn't take him, and I'm not nothing against one-on-one coaches. But Fred is at a stage where he's got to play a certain way. If he doesn't play a certain way, it'll be eaten up. Over Christmas, you've said that. I mean, he's not going to be training at Chelsea mm. over Christmas. So, what's your program going to be for Freddie over that two-week period? Uh, in the garden, loads of on his other foot, his weaker foot. Just keep on touching it with his weaker foot. He can play with his other foot now. He can do. I've seen him do. Is that, that because but... you weren't good with your left foot? Is there I a little bit? I think the game's that? changed now. I think. I think foot, that's yeah. the one thing that's we changed. We had an argument about. And that I don't before. think there's not many two-footed players around. So don't anybody sit there and think, oh, no one. I don't see anybody in the Premier League that's naturally two-footed. Virtually hardly. There's no Casolas around. You know, Casola at Chelsea was unbelievable. He could take a in-swinging corner with one foot. Go over the other Arsenal. side, take an in swing. Yeah. yeah. Anti because uh, like here now, you find me a footballer that plays in the Premier League that can switch the play with a 60 yard pass with both feet, and I'll eat my hat. I'll eat my hat. I mean, Jude Bellingham's not in the Premier League, but I'd say he probably could. Well, he's not in the Premier League. All right, okay. But I got you got the best finisher in the world, one of the best centre forwards in the world who gets 50, 60 goals in Stirl in um in Haaland. Can't kick with his other foot. He's not naturally kicked. He can't naturally kick it with his other foot. 
He, he he doesn't drill it. He won't spray it around the pitch. And and he's one of the best. People, what you got to do is be able to naturally come onto your weaker foot and be able to play a five ten yard pass because no one really. It's you know Jamie. I, I always say. You know, not because Jamie's it. Jamie was one of the best passers there was. Mm. You know, the nearest thing to him in passing wise now for me is Ward Prowse, the way he can spray the ball mm. round the pitch. Not many people spray the ball round the pitch anymore. It's, it's, I call it. Yeah, that'll, that'll come. I can it's Chris Tavare football yeah, now. It's safe. It does it's come safe. from what I did as a kid though. When I've passed, when I used to spend time in the garden, yeah. I always used to just clip a ball and I had to see it. Like the the way that it moved nowadays. Like I, I, I did a game, uh, Sober Slide, the way he strikes a ball, and I, I love it. It's not something that I could have, you know, I, I didn't do because I didn't practice it. You know, if I maybe practiced it, whereas he hits it and there's like a, sm a short um, like follow through, and he just stuns the ball and he makes it sort of dip. Yeah. Whereas I was sort of bought up. My dad was a lovely passer of a ball. Was so he? I watched him like he could clip a ball beautifully, like in demonstrations, whip a ball, clip it. And we used to call about ping, you know, pinging the ball. So I used to spend time, and even when the grass was wet, and just making the ball like, shh, shh, you know, like mm. zipping it, you know, and pinging it. And they're getting that noise. Yeah. And I, even when I got to Bournemouth, there's a couple would always spend time out there. So it's only something that you do. Like when I watch Merce, like I could see it now. Even playing against him, I'd think, I've got, I'm going to show you on your left foot. But I still couldn't stop him playing the one with the outside of his right foot round me and then getting the other side, like round the corner. Well, I was, I was saying to Sean today, that's the first time I see yesterday when Jones does that for I know. Liverpool. No one, I haven't, no one does that. No one does Get in and then just outside the yeah. foot and go. Where did you get that from, Paul? Because I used to do it all the time. My dad used to say, round the corner. What did you, where, because it come, It was such a big part of your game. Yeah, I just think you see pictures. I used to, you know, that was the one thing I could see. I had vision. Yeah. That's what I see with Freddie. He, he sees pictures. He sees the game. Well, no, but what I mean is like in the park, when you used to play football against like bigger kids, yeah. your son used to like drag it and roll it and flick it around the corner. Yeah, it... I would yeah, I would just, yeah, quickly move the ball. I wasn't one of them people. I didn't have all the skills that, you know, I hear people say now about, you know, Ocus Pocus and things. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand all them skills. I didn't have them. That's why Freddie don't do them. As you say, no point in me teaching Freddie something I can't do. No point. You know, I couldn't show him a video of me with that. But what I can do is go get the ball, pass it, move it, pass it, move it. The game will never change. You know, never change. You can have two, you'll have two dribblers in a football team when you get to 11 v 11, if you're lucky. Mm. If you're lucky. After that, you've got to be yeah. able to pass and move. It, it's a fun, I, want to, I want to pick you up on something because we've had this conversation before because when we were, when you, when our boys were at Chelsea and we were talking about whether to put your boy at Chelsea, you had a, like Fulham's yeah, obviously yeah, great yeah, education yeah. as well. And you said sometimes, you know, I want to see that they pass the ball more. Mm. And I was a bit like at the time, yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, because I've got pass, I Bo's a bit of a passer. and But I, I, I would say if Bo was a dribbler, and I mean a really good dribbler, I'd be like, you keep dribbling. Don't worry about it. Like dad said it there and it made me actually think about mm. it. So I'm almost contradicting. Last time I came on the on the, on the, the Project Footballer, we I was talking about, no, no, you got a part. But I was probably thinking more about what's best for my son. But if I if I had a, a like a young, brilliant dribbler, as long as he was edgy, like bright, I would say you not, you should never look at the ball when you dribble. When players put that, when they put their head down, they're looking at the ball, forget about it. You should That ball should be attached to your foot. You know where you are, you know where every player is on the pitch. But if you've got a good dribbler, as long as they cast it at the right time, but I, I think I think that. that's, that's the thing. That, that's the thing. It's decision making. But oh, we got some unbelievable dribblers at Chelsea. But that that's what I was going to say. That it's a, something that I've learned quite recently. I think more than the years of working with you with our group, my mind has changed a bit in terms of that. Some kids are suited you very very early on. You can see in their personality. You can see genetically the way they run, the way that they dribble they are probably going to be a wide player. It suits them to mm. dribble and, and be that type of player. Whereas you've just said with your kid, Freddie, he's not going to be that type of kid. So why are we wasting time getting him to do so much dribbling work? I do understand centre midfielders. You look at De, De Jong, he breaks lines. Like you have centre midfielders do carry the ball. So they need a bit of that 1v1 and to break lines. But... Do they need as much? I think the way that you've worked so much with Freddie on getting him on half turns, helping him receive the ball, creating his 360 awareness so good, he's going to be an amazing centre midfielder. And it's great that you've probably like identified that early. Whereas I think back in the day, I would be coaching players with a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think it was something you even introduced to me, Jamie, where 
I think if you remember the first team that Bo came into, we had LJ, Quinn, Montana. Um, LJ and Quinn have gone on and I think they've got their scholars now. They're, they're doing well in the game. But I would be much like just dribble, just play. No, not affecting anything. Yeah, no, I, I can understand. I can under that's how we I'm not saying it's the right no, way, that's though. that's how we used to play. You know, we went to the park and just played football. I never, I never went to an academy. I was at 12 years of age. I just went to the park till it got dark. And played football, and you know, played up for the for the districts. So I had to play with bigger boys, but I, I, if I had a kid, I, I have nothing against dribbling. Nothing. But, I, but I think I think that I probably didn't coach Bo the right way in that first team because the game was bypassing him. If you remember, he was under six playing with them older ones, mm. and LJ was very dominant on the ball. Quite rightly, very good dribbler. But then Bo wasn't touching it. And I think you were having conversations. I didn't really realise it at the time, but you were kind of a bit, probably a bit shocked that this is the way that football was being done. I think, mm. do you remember it? Can you yeah. take your mind back? Well, yeah, I think because what happens when someone scores a goal, the next thing the parents shout on, you've got to score now, you go and get a goal. So they get as greedy. So I think that you have to just know what you're good at. So if you've got your dribbler, you have your dribbler, but then they've got all, all of a sudden, they all, sometimes they've got to share the ball. Or maybe it's up to the coach to say, all right, now you've scored a couple of goals. Can you maybe play two? touch for me can you maybe get it and can you pass it to someone else or and then because if you start winning 13 14 nil you had a really talented side it almost defeats the object so then you say okay like maybe you do eight passes a goal so if you can keep it eight passes you know to each other that ends up being a goal as well so just making having little games in their head so they don't just all of a sudden become goal obsessed mm. and the individual mm. but I'm also you know but I also there is a part where if my boy was that dribbler and he would start doing things but I would also pick him up and say, Bo, you keep losing the ball. Now maybe pass it next time because you've got someone in a better position. Because, you know, as I say, head down dribbling is not for me. When kids do that, I don't understand sometimes where coaches don't just say, look, even pull them to one side and say, look, you've lost it twice there. You keep doing the same things wrong. Why don't you share it and let somebody else but who's in a better position take that opportunity? You know, and that's where I, I'm a little bit, you know, if you've got a brilliant dribbler, encourage him. If you haven't, don't just make them do it because everyone else is doing it because they're not that player. It's like mm. Paul's got a really talented young boy in Freddie. He knows what he's good at. That's the that's the beauty of football, knowing what you're good at. Like Bernardo mm. Silva knows exactly what he's good at. You know, and that's a, I think yeah, he's, he's a great not, example. He, you know, he, Bernardo Silva's not going to get the ball and run at Carl Walker. He's not going to do that. You know, that's intelligence. You know, he'll play. He'll, give but he'll play it and give and go. You know, I, dribblers. I, I like dribblers, but. It don't matter if it's like with Freddie. If Freddie goes to pass the ball and it ain't on, it's the wrong decision. If someone beats two players and then crosses the ball, and we sc and we score, that's the right decision. Football will never change on making the right decisions. Do you know what I mean? Some of the kids, but when we get to eleven v eleven, you will only ever have two dribblers in the team. You can't have more than two dribblers. So what I try and say to people is, you've got to have a bit more to your your thing. Freddie's not going to. Catch up with you know. I there's you know. I hope they don't mind me saying their names on it. Like, uh, like they dribble past people like they're not even there. Like they're not even there. It's, so Fred is never going to be at that step. You know, he's not going to get to that. So it's too late now. So why why try and take take him to a one on one coach and go right? Make my boy dribbler. His brain tells him if there's two players in front of him. I need to pass the ball. It was interesting, Harry's perception, and he's probably not just watched Bo, but his nephew, you've got another, um, does Mark's boys play mm. for Bournemouth? Yeah, so he's seen a lot of academy football, but it's interesting to hear him say that his perception is academies are all pass, 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 and he doesn't see dribbling. But is that what you guys have seen? You know, what I always used to talk to Jack to Jamie about because you know it was I'm not going to lie you know everybody knows it it was really heads or tails with Fulham and Chelsea because Freddie's he's he's different you know he's he, you know he gets it and passes the ball he don't mess about he gets it passes it you know the one thing I always say to him as well if you get it and pass it because Jamie always used to say to me be careful because it'll get to the stage you'll get it and pass it and he'll never see it again and you know he is right sometimes there you know he'll get it give it don't get it back Get it, give it, don't get it back. But I always say to him, just keep on playing your game. Don't play another game because you'll get left behind. Mm. And he will, you know, he's not going to have the players' feet that I've just said there, but they won't have his vision. Mm. Uh, you know, they won't have his vision. You know, that, that, yeah. I, I know that, but they he won't have their feet. 
he won't have their feet. So he's got to keep on doing the right thing. It is pass, pass, pass. In academies, but, it's pass, pass, pass. I, no, they want you to pass. They want you to make the right decision. Mm. It's just the right decision. If you get someone and you run at someone or you get the ball, you know, Freddie might get the ball, yeah, and and he's a passer and he gets it and he passes it straight away. They might go, you know, the coach will go, Freddie, entice the player in, take that extra touch, take, a, you know, half dribble or take, you know, but it, what parents have to get used to is Freddie's thing is he's got to stay on the ball a little bit longer. So that means it might be to draw you in and then he'll pass it instead of passing it too quickly. But and then other kids one is to pass the ball and not dribble so much. So parents have to understand sometimes that when my boy gets the ball and he goes to dribble past someone and he don't get past them and he, they go, brilliant, I'm lucky. Well done, Freddie. Mm. And then the dribbler gets the ball and he dribbles and loses it and they go, pass the ball. Mm -hmm. they got to understand that everybody's got different situations to do it so you might be told you've got to pass the ball Freddie's been told to stay on the ball a couple of times longer you know we've got to understand that but <sighs> football never change it's so difficult the right decision it's so difficult as well Paul isn't it because I think now when I've seen going through the academies with with my boys that it, I, the, the more I, as I've got older, I've started to appreciate because except when they're six, seven, eight, you do think you start to panic. Are oh, they going to be good enough? Can they do this? But I actually don't think you can really tell until a kid's hit puberty where they're going to end up because that's really the everyone hits it in different ways. They start to maybe go out with their friends. Then you really realise, you know, who wants to be a footballer? What size are they? Because that, I use the phrase, Matt, he's a man boy. You know, like there's some kids at 10, 11, they can kick the ball so much harder than anyone else. They can run through kids. Some little kid that at that age, at six, seven, is probably a little bit timid, a bit scared, thinking there's this big boy running at me. He's going to run through me. Yeah. Whereas when he gets to 13, 14, all of a sudden he's grown up. He feels a bit stronger. That big kid isn't as big anymore and he'll take the ball off him because he's not learned how to pass it. Yeah. So until I, I think, until you get to that age, as long as you've got a good football education, I don't think you ever lose how to play football. Yeah. But it's the ones that haven't got the football brain but are so much stronger than anyone else at 8, 9, 10 they're the ones that they get lost at 14, 15, 16 because mm. they haven't got the brain to go with their strength and everyone else then catches them up because they've hit puberty mm. yeah and there's a lot of hurdles along the way you know as you oh, say just going, jostling for position. going out you know then all of a sudden drink, friends you know what I mean they're all hurdles that you have to jump over along the way they are you know people look at me and I go oh he's drunk he's done this he's done that you, no one sacrificed more than me when I was younger no one. I never got to IB for. I never got to them places with my mates for weekends or weeks away. You know, I was like dedicated at the highest level. People have this obsession. Oh, look, he was a wild boy. You know, later on in time, but not you made up for it later. Not yeah, but that was when I'd made it. You know, don't try and do that and then try and make it. Yeah. You know, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough that I made it, and then my addiction sort of kicked in. Yeah. But we play two different sports at the moment. We took play two. We play seven seven v seven at the moment, where you can get the ball off the goalie, beat every player, and score a goal, and it can be easily done. It's not real life, though. No. Is it? As soon as we get to eleven v eleven, complete. You you'd think we were playing two different sports because mm. that can't happen. It it will never happen. You know, Messi don't even do that. I mean, I don't think Pele, God bless him, did that in escape to victory, even though he said he would, but he didn't. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it it's. It's the ones who get the message. It's the ones who get the message. You have to love football. You have mm. to love football because that will catch up with you, won't it, Jamie? If you yeah. don't love football, it will catch up with you. But everybody's different, and that's the best thing about football. You know, Haaland yeah. is not Harry Kane. He might score more goals than Harry Kane, but for me, Harry Kane's a better footballer than, than Haaland. He has the all-round game. He's the best in the world, in my opinion. Mm. But everybody's different. You've got to use your strength at the right time. As I say, we have in our team, we have unbelievably dribblers. And when they do it right and make the right decisions on top of that dribbling, yeah. they are mind blowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, did the coach mind ever ask you, Burst, what you think? Do they ever say to you, I know Sam put well, he's great. Would he, yeah. ever, would he ever say, what do you think about what, how we're coaching the kids? Or do you just No, we, we do. We, have, we, we chat every now and then. He won't, you know, I, I, he doesn't say, what do you think we should do or anything now? But he's very open. Do you know what I mean? He's very. You know, I'm one of them. You know, people think, oh, they're they're eight, they're nine. Let them play. Like, enjoy. Yeah, enjoy. But if you want to build a house, you've got you've got to put the concrete down first. You know, you're putting the concrete down now to build a house on it. You know, 
I, that's that's the thing. I just think you get left behind if you don't put it in now. Mm. And I think the most important thing, as I say, you, you've got to have a work ethic. You've got to work hard. You know, I, I worked my socks off. Mm. That was one thing I did. And I'm sure Jamie did as well. You know, if you don't do that, it's very rare. I, yeah. I have loads of people come up to me and go, and then they'll be standing next to someone and go, oh, I should have made it, should have made it. Should have made it. You go. Well, why didn't he make it? Mm. Mm. I used to go. I when I when I was, I think back to when I was a kid, sort of thirteen, fourteen. I you know, dad touched on it when what you can't do. And I think that's a really important thing to have the the presence of mind to think I'm okay. I'm a, I can do this. I've got a really good right foot. What could I work on? Maybe can I work on my left foot? That I realised I had to become a better runner. So I would get my trainers on, and there was a run where I used to live in a place called Ringwood, and I'd yeah. go for a, like a half an hour run, and I'd I'd, I'd time it. And I'd have to beat it. You know, that was, there was almost like that saying that no days off. And that was my thing. And I, I knew I had to do it for myself. Like my dad never said, go for a run. They never go, go out in the garden. That's what mm. I did. I knew I had to do it. I had that inner Didn't, desire yeah. to become a footballer. And it meant more to me than anything. No one was going to outwork me. No one was going to stop me. Mm. And that was the thing when I went to Liverpool. It was a different environment. I was amazed that people there, that they wouldn't do extras. Like I, I was like, wow, why are we not doing extra training? Didn't Tony Pulis have a big influence on you? Yeah, Tony, was a, Tony was, um, like, wasn't a talented footballer. <laughs> but when I went, when I went to... To Bourne, when I was at Bournemouth, dad, because my dad's like, he, he's a purist. He loves football and footballers and every, the skill part of it. But two, I had two influences. One was Jimmy Gabriel. Was, Jimmy was a, my dad's assistant manager at Bournemouth. And Jimmy was very tough. Scott played for Scotland, uh, played for Everton. He played with sort of Alan Ball and, and Colin Harvey in the midfield. He had a you know, top player. And Tony Pulis, and they had a different side to the game. Now, they would really be tough and they would be, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, the other, the dark arts, if you like, you know, making sure that you learn how to tackle, make sure you learn, you know, get yourself as fit as possible. And I think you have to look at those sides of it because although the game has changed now, we don't know what, what shape is the game going to be in 15 years. Mm. Like if someone would have said 20 years ago when Paul and I were playing, 25 years ago, that you're going to get to the point where you could like hardly touch someone and you're going to get booked and then you're going to get sent off. Whereas... You know, in our era, the, the game was was like pretty brutal. Now, you don't know if the people that come in charge of Platini pretty much changed how football is, how it's shaped now. But you might get someone in and says in 20, well, I want to go, I want to change the rules, make it a bit more where there is a bit more aggression. There is, you, you mm. we're, we're planning for our kids in an environment right now with athletes, mm. but it might switch. You mm. just, you just never know how the game can change. Well, it did. Barcelona, it was, wasn't it? You know, mm. Barcelona, all smaller players. You know, Indiesta, Xavi, Messi, people like that. All small. Wenger come in at Arsenal, you know, got one of the greatest Premier League teams of all time. You stood in the tunnel with that team and you were looking up in the air. You know, Petit, Vieira. But that was like before that. the Barcelona. No, that was after, like just after, around that time. So they, they went to that sort of stage as well. Do you know what I mean? Arsenal went to that. But cause I still think... Different countries is different. I think if you're in Spain, I think it, it's it's done differently. I, I was in Spain a while back and I watched a game on telly, Real Madrid kids against someone. I don't speak Spanish, but they looked about 10, 11, these kids. They were playing on a full-size pitch with full-size goals. It was on the telly. Yeah. You, that's, you know, they were all like, it's passing balls, mm. moving. Mm. You know, we play. Sometimes you couldn't swing a cat on some of the pitches we play on. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's... It is different. You know, you have to have quick feet to get out of them situations where the pitches are so tight, you know, but it, it's horses for courses. See, there's this big rhetoric and this conversation that's happening a lot online of people saying mercurial players are dying out and the game is becoming athletic chess. More emphasis on managers and tactics than the players. And my theory is it's not necessarily so much the athleticism that has changed things, I feel it's Pep Guardiola, it's possession football. Because if a player like Hazard flicks a ball around a corner and 50% of the time it works, but the other 50% you lose it, and now you've got to chase the ball for 10 minutes, managers are not going to want to take risks on those type of players. And I think that has been the biggest change, in my opinion. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I mean, Jamie, they... they caught on it yesterday um, watching the Liverpool game, Jamie and his dad. And 
it was true. You know, how many, how many shots are scored outside the box anymore? Because people want to keep the ball. You know, if someone has a shot from 25 yards, the first person to say something is the commentator or the co-com. Oh, my God, what's he shot for there? You know, if it doesn't go in. And two, the manager throws his hands up because they want to keep the ball. You know, they want to keep the ball. It's... It is a hard one. I mean, Pep Guardiola's changed. Of course, he's changed the game, and he has by the fullback coming in and playing like Arsenal do with Shevchenko now. You know, he takes it one further and goes, Well, now all of a sudden people are caught onto me. Now Stones comes out and plays in midfield. It, you know, he, he he's making it harder for, for other coaches to try and catch on to what he's doing, you know. But then all of a sudden now, Man City come back and they could be 12 points behind a Liverpool or Arsenal or even 10 points behind Aston Villa before they play again. So he needs to change it up again. You know, it it is changing. It is changing. But I don't want to sound old school, but you still got to put the ball in that back of the net. You know, again... You know, he plays with dribblers still. He might pass the ball, but you give the, he gets the ball out to Doku as quick as possible, who has a dribble at the defender. Or it might be Foden, or it might be Grealish. You know, I know Grealish don't dribble as direct as what he usually he was at Villa, but they have a way of playing. You know, but it will move on again. It's Jamie's right. What's the game going to look like in 15 years? I mean, we might not even have refs in 15 years. <laughs> It might, you know, it might. It, it, that might, is it, really, Paul. It is. Yeah, because you, we just because it's changed so dramatically since yeah. we played. Oh. Yeah, because I, you know, I, I always, you know, think back to when I played the first twenty minutes of the game. The, the, we were told, you know, that ball comes into you, you just turn it round the corner, earn the right to play. Whereas now, straight up, you know, as soon as the game starts, you're playing it back to your goalkeeper. Yeah, he's playing it, and you play, you know, the, you, you playing it into midfield. You're taking risks at the back. You know, there. are it's changed in such a manner with and I think the biggest change without doubt has been goalkeepers okay mm. because goalkeepers now like in my day they weren't uh, you know the last thing you want to do is have your goalkeeper touch the ball mm. because they were not great on it whereas now they give you that extra man when you're building up from the back they're yeah. so confident that you know that look at what Brighton do and deserve it's so unique you know they take so many risks but they'll look at the risk and they look at the reward and it outweighs you know taking you know anything that will, will come against that so i i i have got you know i i look now and think god i would love to play in this era yeah because i know they talk about athletes but the pitches are so good you don't ever get a bobble. You know, you're receiving the ball every time you've got it. No one really can foul you or hurt you. Whereas in 20, 20 years ago, oh. if we played against Paul, we I would have said to somebody, because he's a danger man, we got to get, you've got to try and leave a bit on him. Mm. You know, nowadays, if anyone does a bad tackle, you know, like the, the, there was a, a Caicedo tackle yeah. on um, Anthony Gordon, the cup yeah. game we were doing. I don't get me wrong, it wasn't a great tackle. He was late. Did he mean it? I, I genuinely, I'd like to think not, because in this day and age of two minutes doing a tackle like that, but in my era, if you had a chance to do someone early, that was exactly what you did. So the mm. game is now moved in such a way that it does work so much better for technical players. But my theory is it's not so much coaches. I think sometimes players are scared to make or to do something different because they don't want to become a meme. They don't want to make a mistake. Wow. So they'll go safe. Jurgen Klopp touched on it with a Curtis Jones and he said, I want him to use that ability that he's got more. Because sometimes he plays safe. Because I think players are now, they're scared to make a mistake because of what can happen on the back of it, whether it's like a social media meme mm. or they could get criticised, you know, and they worry about what maybe pundits or the press might say about them. There's not that freedom anymore that we perhaps were lucky enough to play in. Well, you was at the game, you was, you'd done the game for Sky on a Chelsea game the other night against Newcastle. I, I went with Freddie. I thought it was a testimonial at times. It's played at such a slow pace and everybody just stays on the ball because, no, as you say, no one could tackle anybody. No one goes and gets in people's faces. When people get in their faces like Aston Villa did with Man City two weeks ago, Man City couldn't stop giving the ball away because mm. everybody got got close. That's not the way the game is anymore. You know, teams, you know, who would have said even 10 years ago that the centre-half's going to stand in the six-yard box and get the ball? Off the goalkeeper. I mean, or the centre half will pass it to the goalkeeper for the goalkeeper to start. But that is more entertaining because I just want to put a counter to. But no some one's, of the more... no one hardly ever scores from that situation ever. No, but ever. you hold the ball. You you want the ball on the ground. You've got more chance of scoring if the ball's on the ground. But I I don't. I mean, every every club does it. Every club does it and do it at least thirty times a game. Yeah. So if you times that by thousands and thousands. I don't think I've seen more than two goals 
ever in the Premier League where the goal is past the ball in the six yard box and they've knife gone through a knife through butter and scored at the other end. I mean, it causes more problems yeah. than it doesn't cause. You know, and we, mm. we're finding you're doing that in the lower leagues now. But but you draw space behind, so there are, you know, Arsenal, City. If they press so high up, there are occasions where they will go behind. Yeah, like yeah. Bright, Brighton are a good example. Like, I love watching Brighton. Well, yeah. Brighton and will go and all the way home yeah. to start again. Yeah, and he coach he coaches in a way where he gets patterns, and every time they get the ball in a certain situation, he will move players into positions. They get they'll they'll stop it and he'll show them on a on a screen during training sessions. Deserby, he's pretty unique. Yeah, but I think a lot of coaches now and managers actually do it because they feel they have to really? because it's the modern day and if okay. you don't you look like a dinosaur coach so mm. okay well but if you said to a lot of coaches what you really when you when we have a goal kick here and you're playing it out to your center back are you re- is that really what you want to do because of my fear my feeling is some coaches would rather get it long work on the second ball maybe try and play in their half and then work with the ball and i don't mm. think but some but I, if, I feel that's the, just the modern game now but like if we think about like city over the years and the Barcelona where they would force a team to play that long ball and then company would win the header and now Man City are holding onto the ball for 10 minutes and you're drained and statistically oh, yeah. oh, the I'm teams... Oh, I'm for that, would, by the yeah, way. Because yeah. that's what... I've, if I said to me now, I'm going to play defense. If you're playing where Rodri plays for, for Man City, that would be a dream. He's just popping the ball around. He's so comfortable on it. He's like a free man. He's like the quarterback in that position. You can't get near him. Yeah. So I do. I'm not trying to say I don't like it. I love I, what Pep's done. He's revolutionised the game, but he's revolutionised the game with the players that he has and he signs. But there's some coaches that they got they play like Paul Merson says. You know, like Paul says, I will watch a game in the lower league. And when I watch, I watch Monday morning on Sky. There'll be lower league games conceding goals. 95% of them will be because they tried to play it from the back and they're playing with centre back that unfortunately can't play football, but the coach who thinks he's turning to Pep Guardiola, they give the ball away, cost themselves a goal. And it's like, just if you can't play, you've got to work to the, you know, what you've got. You can't just all of a sudden turn into we're going to become a football team if you haven't got those players that can do it. Mm. Mm. I agree. I'm just going to interrupt the podcast for 30 seconds to tell you about We Make Footballers. We Make Footballers are the largest football coaching provider to children aged 4 to 12 in the UK, operating across 200 facilities. We focus on developing the individual, working on the technical and physical components of the game, and it's had amazing results with hundreds of our ex-players joining professional academies and four of our ex-players currently playing in the Premier League. Our programme is built around small-sided play using indoor and outdoor facilities. Visit our website, wemakefootballers.com, to see if we have a training facility in your area. Can you guys see a reason why we haven't produced as good defenders, maybe, as some of the other nations? Because uh, of YouTube, probably. Everybody watches YouTube and watches everybody doing skills and want to be, you know whoever it may be now, everybody wants to be Bellingham now. Everybody wants to play midfield because of Jude Bellingham. You know, people, what you've got to be careful of, and as I've said this before, there's so many unbelievable dribblers at the moment. You mm. you know, watch dribblers. But no one has an interest in defending at the moment. You get the odd kid who, who wants to defend. Everybody else got no interest. So the dribblers skip past the kids like they're not there because they're not. But the thing is, then when you get to 12, 13, 14 years of age, then you're coming against someone who's going to get low, they're going to jockey you, they're going to be as quick as you, and they're going to work you out and go, right, what foot are you in? So then you've got to change your solutions. That's what I say about dribblers. You know, at the moment, we have no defenders. There's hardly any defenders Well, John Stones is a, John Stones is one where you'd say, John is a we have Rio Ferdinand many years ago. John is a, that ilk, you know, that he can step into midfield and I, I, that's what I would love to see us do you know if you're going to play you know with a with a back four John Stones and I mean who his partner can be is that that's the, maybe the one that we're going to find quite difficult I, I do think he'll go with Harry Maguire because I don't, I don't look at he doesn't probably think there's anybody else Levi Cole will play in at Brighton last year I thought right that's the future but I've been disappointed with him since he's but got he's not playing he's, he's playing no, a full back saying, he needs to but play even when he's yeah. played centre back he looks he hasn't I don't know there was something that's missing from when he played against, played for Brighton I don't know does Zerby just maybe extracted something out of him that he needs to get but no I do think that we we haven't got the the the, the right makeup defensively that you would that you would probably like, 
But we have, you know, there are players like John Stones who's unique. John would play for any team in the world. You know, he's such a talented footballer, you know, and anyone that can go play in midfield, which is, you know, I think is a hard position to play and make it look so easy and outnumber other teams. Um, but we have to be careful that we do it with the right players because what managers are now, they're all sheep. Everyone's seen what Pep's done by bringing a midfield player in, uh, bringing a defender into midfield and, they, and everyone else then tries to do it. You know, why, you know, so it's, they all copy each other. Some, a, team wins a, a team wins a league player three at the back, I will play three at the back. Mm. You know, it, there's not very many that go, no, we're going to stick to what we're going to do. And we're mm. gonna, this, is what we're, this is how we play best. And that's what Gareth's got to figure out. Mm. What's our best way of playing? Don't worry about copying another, any other managers because you think that's the modern way of playing. Play what you think is the, the best way to get success for England. Mm. I think, I think Colwell, I, I like him. I think, one, he's playing out of position, but two... Last year when he played at Brighton, he played with a lot of urgency. They got the uh, Brighton played different to Chelsea. They get the mm. ball and they bang, bang, and they pop it quick. Even the ball from one defender to another's done quickly. At Chelsea, you watch it and it's just it's so slow across the back. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's like it's not that urgency, and you know. And I think he he's getting that rubbed off on him, and looking at people like Silva, who's a Rolls Royce, who's one of the best defenders in the world of football. But he, I think he's trying to play like Silver plays now at 39 and he's 21, 22 years of age. And I think that's, you know, I think he needs to go, right, Silver got to this because he's 39 he plays that plays that way. Do you know what I mean? He's like just a Rolls Royce. But Caldwell's got to play like a 21-year-old with more urgency. And I think that can, helps. Can I, I'm going to take this off subject to what we, we, we just like, were just thinking about with Dad there. With... With a lot of parents now growing up with kids, because this is what, what when when we spoke about doing this podcast, the one thing that really appeals to me is trying to help parents and everyone wants their kid to be, you know, a footballer. What is that? What does it take? What What's the magic ingredient to get your talented young kid onto a Premier League pitch? A lorry yeah. load of luck. It, 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 <laughs> no, it's so true. Not, but not, oh, no, no luck. I but tell you what, you need a lot of luck, believe no, me. Not just luck. <laughs> but do you think now with parents, you know, because if we, you know, t you know Tim Grimway, yeah, yeah. you know, Hezzy is yeah. a young player that plays like he's, you know, he's got, a, I would say he, that's, you know, he, I don't know what actually, you've ever, if you've ever asked the question, is that nature or nurture or what he's got? I think it's nature. He's so talented. But do you think now with, with parents and when they hear what we said as ex-players, do you think they sometimes take that on board? Or do you think parents go, no, no, I know what I've got to do and this is the way it's got to be done? I mean, yeah, Paul, you're meeting a lot of parents being in the academy programme. I think you've, you've had different experiences, haven't you? Because Fred is not a dribbler. So it's different because Fred is not a dribbler. You know, and I say, you know, you pass the ball, and you probably they probably think, well, because he don't dribble, he passes the ball, and I understand that. I understand that. I I, I only talk to him if they want to talk to me. But one thing will never change, and I always say to every parent, make the right decision. That's mm. all it is. Just mm. making the right decision. You know, that right decision might be beating three players and scoring a goal. It might be beating two players and passing the ball. If you beat three players and and lose the ball, you've made the wrong decision. Mm. You know, and that's that's all I say. I, you know, I'm not I'm not fussed if if parents don't listen to me. If I'm being honest, I don't. You know, I talk to them, and people might ask me, but the game won't change. You watch the best team in the world; they pass and move the ball. You mm. have to pass and move the ball. If you can't pass, you'll never make it as a footballer. I don't care what anybody says. You've got to be able to pass the ball. It doesn't have to be sixty yards, but it's got to be five or ten. And you've got to understand the game. I hear a lot of people at the moment. I hear a lot of parents. I was I, about my kid. I don't care about the team. About my kid. Mm. I don't care. Another thing, you have to play in a team at the end. If you don't play in a team, mm. you'll get found out. And when you get to 12, 13, 14, kids will go, I'm not passing to you. Don't mm. pass to me. I won't pass to you. And they're not stupid or he's not running. So if he's not working for the team, we, we won't get him involved. You know, I'd... And that, that I only passed my experience on, and, and the game hasn't cha it hasn't changed that much. Believe me, you know I I honestly, and I'm not being big headed. I, I honestly think I could play now. I could play now, not at my age now, but when I was in my pomp, I could play now. You mm. kidding me? You, you did a, I don't embarrass <laughs> you, but you're one of the best players in the Premier League. Trust me. That's what like, I, mean, I mean, I want to play. Not, you, you, uh, that, that, yeah, that goes without saying. And that, and that sounds... It's very hard when you've got two ex-players. Yeah, so, uh, that's but, what I mean. Well, we, but, but the reason why, we would... I think it was like a, you had a football brain, you know, in terms of knowing when to get the ball, when to receive it, when to pass it. 
Whereas I, I think now the game has become, you know, I think man, coaches have such a, they stranglehold sometimes players and so they let them, there's no freedom for them to make mistakes. Mm. And I do wonder if that is sometimes because of what the, what the consequences might be or if mm. they make a mistake, what does that do with social media and things like that? I think players now are so scared of it. Mm. I hear stories now that players, as soon as the game's finished, they all walk in. The first thing no they're doing way. is looking at their phones because they're thinking what they say on Twitter about me or whatever. And that's like, that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. were so lucky that we didn't yeah, have to go with that. Yeah. Like you have, a, the worst we had to deal with was a phone in, right. you know, and if you were a bit, if you had a bad game, you get a bit of stick on the phone in, but yeah. at least then that would be it. You might get a bit on the Monday morning, you could get or all your games. out of 10 and that was it, wasn't it? What yeah. players have to go, well, what Harry Maguire's had to go through as a player. Mm. That, 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 no one deserves but they're that. But mm. they're doing something right at academies. Because as I say, we're sitting in now, we expect England yeah. to really yeah. win the Euros. We've got yeah. very, very good, talented young kids. That's it. And linking it back to your question, Jamie, from my experience, I mean, we've got to now something like 40 episodes of this. So I've been doing so much research on the patterns of what makes a footballer and interviewing you know, top players from ones who've made it down to ones who are in the programme making it. And I do definitely see patterns, you know, they, this is sort of 10,000 hour rule that's talked about. But if you do the maths on that, that's about two hours a day practice for 14 years. And that probably anecdotally, I hear that generally, you know, it's, it's two hours of some sort of football development or some sort something that's taking you towards your goal. That makes sense. I see commonly parents not putting pressure on the sidelines. That is a something that I think is positive and that happens with players that go on to make it. There's now people optimising bedtimes, water, there's th thought around diet, there's one-to-one -one coaches that are yeah. good ones. I'll tell you, so it was you asked my dad about my... Yeah. Th I, my I I didn't, when I was a kid, I was so fussy. I used to have you? sausage, bacon and chips. My mum, I was, I wouldn't eat. My mum just used to cook me that most nights, but she wanted to cook me pasta and things. I got older, but that was when I was seven, eight, nine, ten. I was, that's all I used to want to eat. But wasn't it that's Tony the... Pulis that changed that for you? Didn't he? Not give really, you no, I just, I just suppose, I, you know, we'd go to the Italian, my dad had an Italian restaurant as we got older in Bournemouth and he'd go to have a bit of pasta or whatever. But I think now, if you're 11, 10, 11, 12, and, you, and you've, had, you've done your training, and you're saying to your kids, oh, you can't have an ice cream. Or, you can't, don't, and, or you're saying to them, no, don't have any chips today. Or every now and again, go and have a burger and chips. I think you're losing your childhood. I think you're actually, that's, that, that comes down to bullying your kids. I think at that age, because there's the variables that got, you've got to get, as Paul says about having luck, they've got to be kids at the end of the day. You know, and I look back and think, you know, my, my, my older boy now, I was like, yeah, you've got to do this, you've got to train. At the end of the day, he couldn't play, so it was, no, it was pointless. He, was, he wanted to play rugby. I pushed him out. I pushed him away from football. Mm -hmm. You have to be so careful. If you put too much pressure on your kids, they can completely go the other way when it comes down to it. So you've got to let them have the fun. You've got to let them spend time with their mates. You know what? If it's a every now and again having an hour on on a on a games console or doing something that maybe you probably don't agree with, and I I'm I'm quite strict like that. You know, phones are a killer. Right. They're a killer for players right now. That's the biggest problem in our, in for any 14 to 20 year old. If once they get on their phones and they're looking at stuff and they're looking at TikTok, I don't care what anyone says or if they think that their phone is going to get in the way of their football, that is the biggest modern day killer of a young footballer, I think. While they sit there and they're looking at their screens and they're taking on useless information, that's no good for them. After a game, you know, sometimes I get in the car with Bo, we say, come and chat about football. He just starts looking at his phone. And it does, it absolutely does my head in. You, and I think that's a major problem for kids now. They spend the day, you know, at night, I think before, you, where we were lucky, once you got, once you said, well, I'm going to go to bed, maybe you'd read or do something or watch a little bit of TV. But now, look at that little screen. You're, you're just, you're subjecting yourself to, to, Colors and and yeah, fast yeah. moving object that increases you, your adrenaline. Increase it, yeah, you know, uh, cortisol because it, it yeah. cortisol, not uh, cortisol. Yeah, cortisol. I think it's called. 
not it's it's terrible and i think it's so bad the more you can get your kids off their phones but like i have a i have a rule now and not because of football because i wanted to have a first of all my 14 15 year old pro i want to have a good education so you got i take his phone off him he doesn't like it it's world war when we, every time i say it but I, right half, nine o'clock no phone mate because you need to get to sleep you need to get yourself ready for tomorrow and that's not because i want it to be a footballer i just want it to be a switched on that's exactly possible. what ruben i did a, i told you i did a podcast with ruben the other day and he this one will be released before that so hopefully the parents can listen to that episode but yeah this great trainer of all these amazing athletes and with his children he'll take the phone off them at night so that they can get that good sleep and try yeah. and get as much REM sleep as possible because it's so required just to be successful in life yeah. and you're not taking it off because like, I've not it sounds like I'm con contradicting myself there because you're saying don't have fun whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that there has to come a time where phones are, are they're becoming such a distraction for kids and not a positive one. Now get them talking, have you know, find little games that you can play as, as a parent or whatever. Just find ways to talk about their game. What do they like doing? Even switch away from football. But if you're going to at seven, eight years of age, think you're going to turn your kid into this little pet project where he's going to be a footballer by doing all these things all night every night. You will end up driving him insane, and I, m I reckon more often than not, you will push him away from the game. Nope. You get the odd one or two, but more often than not, it won't work. That was the one thing I've like just stuck in my head. You just said two hours a day for fourteen years. Yeah, it's impossible. You can't do that. Why? What two hours training a day for? Yeah, but it could be two years. hours practicing with a tennis ball. It doesn't have to be or hitting a birdcage. It doesn't have to be no. actual like an intense no. two-hour session. <laughs> you got one. You got. One, a professional footballer don't train that. What about swimming? Like two hours, it could be swimming. That's what I'm saying. It's something that's taking you towards becoming a footballer. Yeah. And one but... of them things is rest. Okay. Rest is so important. You cannot believe how much rest is important. You know, people, it don't matter if you, you're trying to make it as a footballer, you still got to rest at the right times. Mm. You know, I, 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 it blows my mind with all the one-on-ones that, uh, that, that the kids have. You know, train four days a week. Two hours a day, four days a week. You know, and that's sitting in the car for an half Some an hour. Some of them are charging least. 200 pounds. Yeah, but like, yeah, but so we're charging, we're, we're like four days a week. So all two hours uh, Tuesday, two hours Thursday, two hours Saturday, game Sunday. I mean, how much more do you want to do? Yeah, I know. If you're, if you're working as hard as you possibly can on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday and Sunday, I don't see what you have to do by that. It's a good. I'll give you a bit. So it's very you know, only when you sort of do these things, it always becomes quite therapeutic for you to mm. realise what what made you a footballer. And, mm. and, I, and I think so. I've got two two situations where I can speak. So Frank and myself, very close as kids. Now there is no way I would have made a footballer unless I had great school teachers. So in my school teacher, the guy mm. called Mr. Jackson, Mr. Broadwell, they're brilliant. And after school, I used to spend hours playing badminton, and I mean hours. So there's no doubt. I was quite a tall, sort of 13, 14. I stretched. I was a bit skinny. I needed to move my feet. So subconsciously, Mr. Jackson would play, you know, so for me to play badminton was just perfect because you have to move your feet. Mm. You have to get around the court. It's sharp. It's, it's, mm. it's conducive to being, you know, for football. And then I'll go and play tennis. My dad in the summer would play me playing tennis. We'd go play golf. So we were multi-sport family. So anyone that thinks you just got to play football, you're going to drive your kid insane. Be a great sportsman. We had a table tennis. I mean, it, it sounds like you know we had a few quid as a kid, but my dad got a table when we a table tennis table. We had a snooker table. We used to go and play snooker at the local snooker hall. Mm -hmm. Play sports because every every other sport that you play, snooker, there is a, in a in a in a weird way will be good for beneficial for your football because it's problem solving. Badminton is all about working your feet. Same with tennis. It's so important. And Frank was the same. Frank was an unbelievable cricket. He could have played for Essex. Mm. And he would play tennis with me in the summer. Frank could play all sports. I could play all sports. Even now, I'll give anyone a game of table tennis or badminton oh, yeah, or whatever, snooker. And that's what you have to be able to do. Because if you're going to, if you think that there's only one way to do it and it's going all, all in on football, you're going to drive yourself mad and you're going to drive your young kid mad. Mm. So be really open-minded about learning as many different disciplines, different sports. You'll, you'll get appreciation of other sports people. Learn from what it takes to be a great badminton player, tennis player, rugby player, yeah. all these different sports. 
there's some examples of. Oh, do you do agree? I don't. Would you agree oh, with that, Merce? Yeah. I, I, again, I I put that down to rest. You're away from football. Yeah. So you, you you're giving your mind a rest. You can't just constantly keep on thinking football. I like I like the badminton one. I mean, I've done that. I played a lot of tennis. I, I was good yeah, at tennis. tennis. Great. I played tennis because you're always you watch any professional tennis player. They are always moving. They but, never stand still. But on tennis, for young kids, in my experience, I've seen I've seen a few kids quite flat footed, and I thought, you know what? I wonder if the tennis is impacting their feet. Well, they're not playing tennis properly. You should always be on your toes at yeah. tennis. That's okay. the one thing you've are got. You do not be. lean back on your heels. Well, you may, maybe when you take a shot, depends if how, how bad. You're bouncing, you're bouncing. Yeah, you're always bouncing, you're always moving. I like the badminton one. You know, Sluka, you, it's Sluka Freddie, gives Freddie, you... Freddie's just good a, at, Merce's got his phone out, he's booking, yeah, he's yeah, booking yeah. badminton for Freddie. Just got some shuttlecocks. <laughs> <laughs> <I mean, laughs> they're cheap. <laughs> and, Andre Agassi, Tiger Woods, yeah. the Serena Williams sisters, yeah, yeah the Williams sisters... Their parents drove them to be those athletes from a very, very young age. I did, yeah, I, I, I do understand what you're saying. They, they, but you're, they, they, you're talking, you're, they're like, they're extreme. You just named the, 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 the best in the world at what they did. All of them were the best in the world at and, what they did. And Agassi and Tiger Woods did have breakdowns as they got older psychologically well, Agassi, I've read Agassi's book he yeah. talks about the dragon and the dragon was a his dad had a um, a machine that used to fire balls at him and he reckoned it was at such a ferocious speed that he used to have to spend hours and it used to, it now he talks about it after he'd retired you know it made him ill you know he was so scared of it he didn't have a good relationship with his dad now that works two ways because if he hasn't got the dragon he doesn't make the the, the amazing mm. tennis player that he does so there always has to be a consequence with with hard work and to be if you want to be any top sportsman, the dedication and the sacrifice you have to make when your mates are going out to party at 16, 17, like Mer said, and you you're you're turning around and there's a good party and there's a real there's a girl you really like and you want to go and see her, but you've got a game the next day and you have to weigh it up. Do I go and try and get my get a kiss or am I gonna stay in tonight and get a hat trick? They're they're there's there mm. is what it's all about, and that's the sacrifices you have to mm. make. You know, I did both. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. By the way, I did because the girls was about nineteen. Man. I swear to God, honestly. Uh, but we made up for it, though, mate. Yeah, yeah. You can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why you want your kids to be footballers. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I say that. I, and I do, and I'm I'm sitting here now. So I've got a two year old. So I've I've dived back in. Now I'm not going to lie. I see Freddie. Freddie's eight, 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 eight. Yeah. and I, and he left. He's a lefty, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Right. He was the most right footed player. Everyone in my family has always been right footed. Now, Rafa has come out, and he's a left footer. Frida's dad was a tennis coach. Frida's six. She's five nine, five ten. She's going to be tall. And there are times when I, I, I think to myself, and I, I've stood on the sidelines, you know, watching football. It's been so good to me. I adore the game. You know, my granddad was, it was such a big football fan, my brother, uncles, everyone. You know, and it's been so good to me. Yeah. But there are times when I, I look and I go, do I want to go through that again? Like parents shouting. I've seen under seven dads fighting each other. And, and Or do I think, you know what, maybe I'll try it. If he want, if he wants, or if he's talented, maybe take him into tennis. Maybe take him into golf. You know, golf's a massive passion of mine. Mm. You know, individual sports, I think, can send you a bit mad as well. Mm. But sometimes there are there are elements of football, and the way it is now, and the parents, and the hunger, and and how ferocious it's got. I don't always think it's healthy. But I don't like it. I don't like it. I, I, I'm, the, I'm a little bit like that. I, I do like it. I, 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 you love to, you love I to love it. it. Yeah. I love it, but I don't, if you know what I mean. I don't. I, it's so long, you know, with someone like me who's, who was always yesterday. Do you know what I mean? I lived my life like I wanted everything yesterday. It's hard. It's but, hard. I don't, I, I don't, because I'm so an addictive person. Do you know what I mean? And I know it's just a long time. But, but when we started Freddie started getting good at football five yeah. years old and we started to form the team and we st they all started getting good at football and you were joining the sessions and you're coaching 
we would have phone calls probably like four hours a week. Like you really got into your football. And... Oh yeah, I get into it, but I, it's, I, I, I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it again. Like if I had another kid, I don't know if I will, but if I had another one, I, I, I ain't sure. I'm, I'm not. Honestly, yeah. I'm not. I think it's, you know, it's hard work. You know, there's not days. That, there's days that I come away from. I'm not going to lie. I think should have. Should have. You know, part, you know, I, I'm a great believer as well, and I don't get this one, and I don't get this, and I, I am one of these. In football, you're going to be a certain position. Freddie's going to be a certain position, as we talked. He's not going to be a winger. He's not going to be a Paris or, or Fahis or Reese or someone like, you know, like amazing feet, go past people like they're not even there. He's going to be a centre midfield player or a number 10 or someone like, around that position sort of thing, a midfield I don't get why they don't always play there. A jack of all trades won't get you anywhere. It won't get you. It, you'll be lucky if you get to Brighton as a jack of all trades. No disrespect to Brighton. You have to be unbelievable. In the last six months, I have seen now, watching other teams in academies and all that, I've seen how at 12 13 they're going to get people from Brighton and Southampton and places like that. I see that now. Because. That player is playing in that position every single week and they can only get better at that. If I went, if me and you went to college tomorrow and I was training to be an electrician, but I took electrician and woodwork mm -hmm. and you just done electrician, mm -hmm. who's going to be the best electrician when we finish in four years time? It's going to be you, in my opinion, because you, you just had more and more hours at it in that, you know, and people might go back then and go, well, you're saying you need rest, but I, it's all about playing football at the end of the day. You know, it's who sees the pictures, who get, who gets the game, who knows when to drop back in, who knows when that ball's going to be played there. Them there, all there things. Are there are definitely benefits of rotating positions at a young age. Yeah. Getting a whole understanding of the game. Like, think what Pep Guardiola would want or Johan Cruyff. Yeah. Like, I never played anywhere else apart from centre midfield, though. didn't you? Ever? That's what, okay. That's what I mean. I don't. I don't. Oh, that, I would, look, right. I had to play right midfield for Liverpool when I first got on the team, but that's pretty what you do. But I just. I played. I had an understanding because I used to watch so much football anyway. I just knew what. Yeah. Like, I watched. So I, much, I, I, I played. I played centre forward the whole of my whole of my kids' career, all of it. Mm. In the, I, I, be careful how I say it. In the Beckham documentary, when he went to Real Madrid. And he was saying, I'm a right midfielder. That's what I am. I know that position. Oh, yeah, but he's, he's, we talk, we talk, you know, I never played centre. I, I, I played the whole of my career, centre, all my kid career as a centre forward. Played, won the league in 89 as a centre forward. Then we brought Ian right in. I played right wing. I went straight to right wing. I'd never played right wing in my life. Mm. Now you played left wing. And then I played left wing. Well, you left would now. Right. Yeah. They played, if you played yeah. now, the way the modern game's yeah. gone, I think you, you'd either I played play left wing where I cut wing. in and then I'd be able to play with my right foot. But I always played, you know, when you're talking about Beckham, that's like, you know, he'd learnt the game by then. David no, but Beckham could have played. But, but when Figo, well, well, Figo held that position yeah. and so they moved Beckham into right back and tried to put him centre and it seemed he really struggled with it. Well, he weren't as good as Figo. That was the problem. But then I'm thinking, why should he struggle so much in the other positions if at youth level we've given more of an education and players have rotated position, then they've got a better understanding. They can drop in and they can be more fluid. Don't, you don't, think don't, like don't underestimate positions on a football pitch. That, oh, he can play here, he can play there. You know, Carl Walker can't play as a number 10. Carl Walker's the I personally think one of the best right backs in the world of football. I think he's doesn't nowhere near get the credit he deserves. But he couldn't play centre forward or centre midfield. He's a right back. You know, we've seen him at centre half. You know, sometimes he might fall asleep at centre half. Now, if you fall asleep at a right back, sometimes you're not going to get hurt as much because he's got the pace to get back. But in the foundation ages, yeah, David maybe Beckham he didn't. can't. He can't. He's not. He wasn't quick. If you can't run, you can't be a fullback. It don't matter how much you, you know. Freddie can play as a fullback now yeah. for the next twenty years, but if he's not going to be quick as someone else, very rare he's going to get roasted.
I need to interrupt the podcast one more time. Did you know that We Make Footballers is a franchise business? We began franchising in 2015 and we now have over 60 franchises in operation across the UK, Dubai and US serving over 10,000 players. If you are a talented coach but don't want to start your own coaching business alone, visit franchisewmf.com to find out how We Make Footballers can help you operate a successful football coaching company. Did your granddad scout Rio Ferdinand? Yeah, no, I, I remember it well because I was I was at mum and dad's house at the time and he called up and um, he used to go to Victoria Park in East London. He used to live in Salmon's Lane, which is, like, there's Victoria Park, it's like a hotbed of football, you know, loads of good players. And he, he got back and he could tell he was so, he said, just seen the best young player I've seen in years. He said, go, he said, the young kid, Ferdinand, Rio. He's like, got, you got to get him. He said, did you get his number? Like, I can't remember if he said he had his, his dad was there or something. We got a number for him. They gave it to dad. Dad gave it to the, the, the scouts. But that was the difference then. I think with coaches in, in, in those days, like dad was one that was, you know, he, on a Saturday morning, his day would be, right, so West Ham played at three o'clock. He'd make sure that he was at that youth team game at 11 mm. to watch the youth, because he wanted to know who was coming through. So then they get Frank Senior and my dad would watch the game. Maybe they get you know, 70, 80 minutes out of it. They know that oh, like we've got Carrick, we've got Lampard, we've got Joe Cole, we've got you know it was, a, it was a unique group they had. But I think it was also in a great environment that they created because it was like you wanted to be there because you knew that you had a chance to get into the first team. And the manager like I hear stories where managers don't even watch the youth team. Well, they, no, don't hear stories. They're facts. Yeah. You should know what's going on in the yeah. academy. You, you, you know, if, it, if you go down to a club and if you were even to, to just go and drop into the academy for 20 minutes, and I know they've got a lot of managers, but not yeah. much more than what those co the coaches mm. had in those days, pop into the academy and just poke your head in the door and go and watch those kids. Imagine what that did, yeah. because I could talk from experience of when the manager would come and if he wasn't in the train watching you train, and then all of a sudden he came over, the training level would go up 10, 20 percent mm. because the gaffer's here. Mm -hmm. Now, just to go in and say hi to the academy or go and do, you know, just something in and around the, the youth team or go and put on a session, send the first team player down there. First team players, I think it should be mandatory that you go and get two or three of the players that go down to the under 18s and have a chat with them once or twice a week, even mentoring them. You know, they, so they have on the end of a phone, Reese James is captain of, of, of Chelsea. I don't know the boy very well, if I'm honest. But whoever that young, there should, he should be told, there's a couple of players at, in Chelsea's youth team, do you mind just reaching out from every now and again? I think it'd be good for Reese. I think he'd really enjoy it himself. I love that as a person. Now, I always always talk to the youth team players. You know, not just some, it's easy for me to say, but Gerard, Stephen Gerald will talk about in his book. I would go out of my way to make sure the person that was cleaning my boots like I did in those days, mm. I'd have a conversation with them. Because having good mentors is so important because your parents aren't always the best ones because they feel your pain. They know everything you're going through. When you've had a bad day, like Mercia said, oh, I should have been maybe at Fulham. Then that transmits to your kid. Mm. But where mm. there's someone that, you know, that's maybe a little bit older, that's been through it, and they could say, no, how did you play? No, I didn't play that water day, but I've got some clips. Would you mind having a look at them? Maybe go through them with me. Mm. Mm. That should be, like, you've got, that's you've actually got um, a duty of care, I think, if you know that when you're getting paid a lot of money, whether, you're, whether, whether you are or you're not, I just think it's the right thing to do. And you could be so beneficial to young players mentally because we, we never spoke about mental health. And I know Paul's incredible on this, like mental health of what you're going through. Like I went through injuries when I played at Liverpool and I must have drove myself insane. I was out for a year. People saying, oh, you're injury prone, you don't want to play or whatever. But I was, you know, broken ankles or knee operations. But no one was ever helping me. But somehow I'd get myself in a place where I could just deal with it. I'd go into the gym on my own and manage to get myself on the pitch. But there was no one helping me. But So I obviously subconsciously could just do it. Others can't. But if there is somebody at the club that's been through that, could just reach out to a young player. I think, how good would that be, Paul? You know? and yeah, we, we, I know I know Jay, one of, one of the oh, kids, yeah. dad, uh, Blake, his dad, Jay Simpson, who was who come through the academy at Arsenal. I know he does that at Chelsea, mentors some of the kids, which is good because he has been through the academy. And I think that helps. That helps. Do you know what I mean? Coming through academy football, and he was one of the, you know, the people that come through at Arsenal. So I think, you know, it is important. It is important, especially when you can go and see Jay, them young kids, you know, 17, 18, 21 year olds in the under 20, just to, you know, to see. And it's, and he's, he's done it. So it's, I always find it more important when someone's done it. 
to mm. talk to them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then, you know, ask them the question. And how was it when you felt? And I, that's why I think Gareth Southgate's good because he, he didn't play too long ago and he understands what it's like. So he knows when players are struggling or players can go and go, well, I'm a bit nervous tonight. Yeah, well, I was nervous. Do you know what I mean? When I played this and that. But it, it, it has changed. We never had any of that. I mean, you know, it would be a sign James, of weakness, wouldn't it, Paul? Yeah, it would be a sign of weakness. Now it's, it's. I keep on saying, I keep on going back. It's the hardest thing in the world to be a professional footballer at the top level. At the top, top level, it doesn't come easy. I know you brushed it aside just that you have to Did be I brush lucky. It aside? No, about being lucky. You've got to be lucky. Don't worry about that. You have to be lucky. It don't matter no, how good you are. You've got to have luck. What I, What I meant was that it's not just down to luck I was no trying, but, yeah. uh, that, be, believe it or oh, not when you get to that stage of you might get a chance of the first team it will come down to luck mm -hmm, it will mm -hmm. it will come down to luck you I know look at, look at Rashford factor. look at Rashford yeah Rashford you know you hear people you hear you hear on the grapevine you know you hear about oh he's a good kid coming through here good kid coming through here yeah. you know, he's an unbelievable kid you know Phil Thompson used to come down to, when we was on Soccer Saturday yeah. he'd go I go, any kids? Up? Oh, there's a kid called Sterling. You should see him. He's absolutely electric. Just goes past people like they're not there. This and that. You hear things. Never really heard anything about Rashford. Never really heard on the grapevine. All of a sudden, Europa Cup game. Mm. You know, someone gets injured. Bang, you're in. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. if, if that player doesn't get injured, who knows? Mm. Who knows? Would mm. it have been another year or another two years? In another two years, would he have got disheartened and gone, you know what, I'm going to try my arm somewhere else. I'm not getting a chance at Man United. Mm. Like, you know, I was at Arsenal. You know, I, I had an unbelievable season. Uh, you know, I started the last five games of the season, scored three goals. They'd already bought Alan Smith. They were going to buy Tony Cotty for £3 million, which was an amazing amount of money. Yeah. He chose to go to Everton. I played up front with Alan Smith. I win PFA Young Player of the Year. We won the we won the league that year at Liverpool, you know. And the rest is history. And I went on and played seven hundred times. But if he comes, they're going to play Tony Cotty and Alan Smith up front. Yeah. We had David Rowcastle, God bless him, who was an unbelievable winger. You know, on the other side, I forget who was on the other side. But who's to say I would have played there? If I mm. don't play there, I don't play for Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be, you know. And I'm not just. You know, there's a couple of kids that will be at Chelsea now, just on the border at the moment. You know, yeah. the kid Leo Castile, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. and, you know, and a, bit, a couple of other kids have been subs. You never know, one or two injuries and go bang, wallop, and they're in. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. people play better when they're playing with better players. You know, I I never really played for the youth team a lot. You know, when I got in the reserves and went and trained with the first team, you ask people like Charlie Nicholas, they were like, wow, God, how good's this kid? But when I played for the youth team, I wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't unbelievable. But when I played with better players, and I no disrespect to the players in the youth team, but when I played with better players, I stepped up and people read what I was doing, mm. you know. And, it, it, you know, it's just, you've got to be, you have to be lucky, believe me. And and, and I say that, injuries. Mm. We had a meeting the other week at, at Chelsea about injuries, you know, Oscar Sagas, I had that, you know, things like that, you know. You know, one of our one of the young kids who we know just been out injured for five six weeks. It's hard, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. watching the watching yeah. the kids play. But it's so true because yeah. there's, oh, there's there's certain kids where you watch, so they they'll get Osgood Slattis, which could be a, a year and a half might take to clear up, and you watch that kid and you're going, my, what's happened to him? He's gone. He looks like he can't play anymore. And the coaches are under pressure because they need the crystal ball to realise whether you're going to give him a new contract, and maybe you go, well. He looks like he isn't moving very well. It gets let go. Maybe falls out of love with football. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but you can, that's where you need that. Mercy's right. You do need a bit of luck. Yeah. Because some kids, when they get through that, then they have that massive growth spurt. Yeah. All of a sudden they come through and then they look like a Rolls Royce again. That Rice you, sounds yeah, like that example. You never lose your skill or yeah. ability, yeah. but you can, but your body has so many different changes. Play Kids playing on AstroTurf now, I'm not convinced is great for them. Mm. I think it puts a lot of stresses on their joints that we didn't have because all we ever yeah. did was play on grass. You know, so but some of these grass pitches are more they're more solid than the Astro turf. Yeah, no, yeah, but I think they get they're obviously getting better. But there are so many so many kids seem to have like Oscar Slattis now or, or or Severs, which is the one they get on the back of the hill. Yeah. That really, I didn't you know we didn't have that as much. So I think they're accustomed to maybe more football, and and that's where 
you know, I, I've talked to a few friends that play cricket. When the kids do get that, they take them away from football completely and go and do maybe something else, like another sport, just to let their body heal and, and get better. Mm. Because sometimes you push through it and you don't play well. That puts a lot of stress on the kid because he can't get around the pitch. It puts mm. stress on the parent because they're watching their kid thinking, what's wrong with him? Yeah, you yeah. Know, is there something wrong? Is he no good anymore? Yeah. Because they don't, they don't understand how it works. And they are the different problems that can happen. Yeah. I think you, you put a lot... You have a lot of faith in the coaches, their vision, you know, every every age. Because I don't see, you know, it's hard to imagine your kid like Freddie going to be the same size as Charlie, Ben and Sam, who are like six foot across the ball. You know, but the, pair, the, the coaches see it, you know, they go, right, when they go to nine, it'll be this. And when they go, mm. you know, I don't see all that. But they've had that experience of doing that. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't, I don't get that kind. I don't see that vision. Do you know what I mean? People go to me, I'll, you know, be patient, be this and that. I just don't see. I, I think this conversation has just been unbelievable hearing from you both and, and Harry. Um, we've covered so much. Mm. And I think it's a lot of stuff that isn't openly talked about, especially not from people at your level of the game. I mean, just maybe to conclude the conversation, um, to think about some takeaways that parents might have. I mean, we touched on the future of the game and this thing around, is the game entertaining enough anymore? And, you know, how that links to football development in the type of players that are being recruited, personalities that are being, being recruited, the type of way that being developed. But then I liked what you said, Jamie, that we don't know where it's going to go. We, no idea. We, we, we We've got don't. no idea because you, as you just said 20 years, it might have gone more got more brutal. You, who yeah. knew it would become such a game for like for purists? And it, yeah. And it's, it's that way now. But it did two years ago. I think it went too far where you couldn't, you know, you couldn't touch anybody. Now it's come back a little bit. And I think there is a bit more leniency on tackles. And personally, you know, I grew up, I, I lived in Liverpool for 11 years. And yeah. And sometimes I did a pass and I was like, wow, what a pass. And it would get a little ripple from the crowd. Right. But then if I went into a 50-50 and lunged into a two-footed challenge, the roof so will come interesting. off. Interesting. You know, so there are so... there's so many different aspects and elements of the game that haven't changed and it will never change. Because even now, if you get your tackle right or you go through some this football's working class and that's what they want to see. Is that you still know? is that still the same now? Do you still yeah. see that in the crowds yeah. now? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean every fan, every fan. I I was at Chelsea the other day. Still think Newcastle fans are the best fans in the country, in my opinion. I I, I mean, it's a it's a Tuesday night in London and they packed the whole away end. I mean, yeah. it was unbelievable and didn't stop singing. All they want to see is hard work because all them people behind the goal mm. would give anything to be wearing the black and white striped shirt. And the one thing they can do if they did play, and as I say to Freddie, the only thing you can assure someone is working hard. Mm. Now they know they could work hard. They haven't got the talent of the players on the pitch. Mm. So just got to work hard. My thing, I always, I think every parent should take away, leave it to the coaches. If you was that good, you'd be the coach at Chelsea. But or then, you'd be the coach but then you hear interview Reese James's father and he was putting in work. He, he didn't just leave it to Reese by himself because yeah, he then know, got a really I mean, bad diet and I, yeah, but he needed I, to affect not, what position not, he played. I'm not saying, I'm saying when you're the training round, when right. you're training, right. leave it with the coaches. You know, I see kids coming over to their dad and their dad's whispering something to, to, oh, to yeah. them. Do you know what I mean? Just leave them. That, you know, when you come away, when you when I've watched the game, then I come away and go, Freddie, what do you think? Or, you know, I think we need to work on that because today, you know, you wasn't, you wasn't scanning enough. If you're not scanning enough, there's only going to be one pass on. But to be devil advocate, that's not what Frank Lampard Sr. did. In what way? It sounded like he wasn't not pressurising Frank. Yeah, but what Mercy's saying yeah. is that because he played, he understood. So when he's telling Frank to run or to chase or to do something, it was because he had an education of playing the game. But sometimes if you get a parent that hasn't necessarily played and they're shouting at their kid and they're giving them completely different advice to what the coach is, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah, and you know, if you sat down with got a hundred parents from academies now and said, who's the best player you've seen? They're all saying Neymar. They'll say Neymar. They would. You ask all the kids, they'd all say Neymar. They go, who's the best player you've seen? They go, Neymar. So, well, he ain't the best player, is he? Mm. He's not the best player. But that's the way it is, the game. Yeah. You know, people look at people yeah. and they go, we've got to do yeah, the, that. The thing is that. as well, Paul, is that you've got to, as a parent, you've got to be so smart because you've got to remember there are two, three players in the world. Yeah. That can, 
well, even less than that. When there's Messi, and there's Messi, really. The mm. rest of them are like where you look at even Ronaldo. Is R- Ronaldo is one of the most most hard working players ever to play. Yeah. Mm. And that that was more that was as much he had. Of course, it was nature. There was a lot of nurture that went involved yeah, in making Ronaldo yeah, the player in the gym and the physique and everything that goes with it. Yeah. So parents have got to you know got to remember that that you you can make a great living out of this game, but you've not got to be messy. You're not pro, the chance of creating a messy mm. us are a zero point one percent. That, that, that so is, true. or not even no, no forget it. Yeah, Just forget, forget it. it. Yeah. You, but forget. you can you can if you do things right and you get a really disciplined. Uh, kid, very similar to what I said after that game, uh, after the, the 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 Brighton game when I, I watched West Ham play, and I talked about Jared Bowen, and then I t- like a sort of thing that went a bit viral about. I just said like a lot of coaches now, and they're teaching their kids to do flick flacks and skills. It's not about that. It really isn't anymore. It's just if you've got a good attitude, you want to run, you want to work hard and play for the team. You've got a good understanding of when you're going to pass it and when you're going to keep it and when you've got to move with it. And you're a good person in and around the dressing room, which is what Brentford do so well now. They don't like this. I don't know if you can beat me out, but they, there's like a no pricks allowed in their environment. And that goes from they're just about to start an academy and it's in the same thing in the first team dressing room. If you've got people in there that think they're better than they are, that don't pass when they should, or create a bad atmosphere, they won't have them. They're rotten apples. And that's you can actually earn a great living out of the game by just doing the really simple things well. And that's by passing it and moving, working hard, listening, turning up for training on time and just doing the basics. They, they, they're big I things. Agree. They're big things. Like, they're, like I, I think ha- Harry, you just nipped it in the bud there, Joe. Harry might not necessarily like that because maybe it's contributing towards a less, potentially a less entertaining style of football maybe. But the realities right now, I think, are what you've described, Jamie. I think... For for now, as best as we know, I mean, things might change in the future again. But right now, this is a direction. They, you'll get players on football pitches that will make things happen, like Kevin De Bruyne. When Kevin De Bruyne comes back for Man City, Man City are a completely, in my opinion, they're a completely different team because he does stuff out the ordinary. He finds that pass. You know, Jamie could pass the ball. I could pass the ball. But I still sit there. He's one of the only players I ever sit there and watch when I'm watching the telly and I'm like... How did he find that pass? Yeah, mm. Where was that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Where yeah, was yeah. that? Yeah. I, you know, I don't see too many of them. But Jamie's right. You don't have to be the best. You've just got to be good. Do the right things. You know, turn up for training on time. Turn up for training. And, I, you know, I say that loosely, but people go, yeah, not tonight. I won't come tonight. A bit cold tonight. Traffic's bad. You know, turn up for training. You know, the mess is, they're one in a gillion, a mess he is. But, you, you know, to be a professional footballer, is you have to, whoever gets to be in a professional footballer at any level has one of the best jobs in the world. You're getting up to play the best sport in the world. You're getting paid for it. You're out in the fresh air every day and you're idolised by the people that support you. There ain't many jobs like that in the world. There's not many That's jobs. Right. And... But the main thing is you can have all the skill in the world. You have to work hard as well. You have to work hard. You have to have this. Yeah, yeah. I have to give some context here for that comment because there are there are parents probably listening to this now that will say, well, no, I have got a genius on my hands. And trust me, if you have, you do everything you can to make them be that difference maker. So, but I'm, I'm talking about like an 80% of players that can make a brilliant living. I'm talking about people like Conor Gallagher, who was obviously got a great attitude, works hard, diligent, does all the right things, looks after himself on and off the field. Now and then, of course, you've got like players that can just like your De Bruyne's that just see the game to a different level to everybody else, and that's why they're so loved. But there are, but, but just do the right things, do the basics really well, and you can have an incredible living out of the best job in the world. Like you say, Paul, like I, I, every there's not a day goes by or a night I don't sleep where I don't dream about football and playing the game. Every dream I have at night, and this just might sound ridiculous, involves football. You know, I think about it all the time. There's not a moment I don't talk to my dad, every conversation. And that's the effect it can have on people. Love but that. you've got to love it and you've got to live yeah, for it. And definitely. if you don't, and if you're taking your kid to train and you might be listening to this in the car and he's sitting there and doesn't really want to go or he's like moaning about going or moaning about this person or that person, they're in the wrong game. Just let him enjoy it, you know. But there are, it is, like Paul says, the greatest life if you can get it right. You know, don't put them under too much pressure. Let them enjoy the game. Mm. But I actually think what we should do in, in future is get 
parents to write in questions for us. Mm. Email questions, yeah. you know, we did this because yeah. I think it, because I'd love, because what we see, we've done it, but there's other parents that haven't been that luxury. And like dad said, you know, I think, I can't remember daddy, you said about dads that, you know, a lot of dad, there's so many, I see so many single mums take yeah. their kids yeah. to football, yeah. sacrificing, yeah. going, uh, like doing things that I couldn't even imagine to get their kids an opportunity to play football. Yeah. And they keep themselves out of the way. They're amazing parents. Or, and so there are so many different variables and so many different people that have to do things in I, their own I, way. Th I was going to say that, I mean, Parents take a lot. Should take a lot of credit. The parents. I don't think, you know, the, the the kids should really understand, you know, what they sacrifice. It's a it's a lot of traveling. It's a lot of taking the kids everywhere. And I see parents turning up all the time. And you know, whoever it may be, I, you know, them them parents who listen to this, give yourself credit. You know, give yourself credit because it, it, it is difficult. You know, yeah. you could have you could be the best kid in the world, and if you haven't got a mum and dad who 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 don't want to do it, you won't be a footballer. You won't. It'll be hard to get to training. You know, I know clubs do it now where they can pick players up, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that's the one, is, is getting people to, to like, message in just to answer no. their questions. Because, you know, you can, you can listen to one for hours, but th there'd be that one question, do you know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. I mean, you, you know, because you could be a just... genius, but you've got to remember... This, this, there's a lorry load of geniuses all around Europe and around the world. You know, Chelsea are buying players from South America. I mean, this is how far we're going, you know, at 16 years of but, age. But, like, for, for what we've got access to with you guys, you know, top, you know, play for your country in the Premier League, but you've also had children that have been through grassroots football and academy football very recently, so, so relevant. Mm. Um, so absolutely, if we can get in the room and, you know, we'll go and get loads of questions from parents and then we'll present to you guys, that would be amazing if we can make that happen. And I think also the perspective of Harry, you know, a father who produced a footballer, I think that might be a thing that we could do more as well. You know, get footballers in, get them to talk about how they made it. Because like you said, the game's no, not changed. Yeah. You know, the things that happen for, for you guys, parents can learn from now. And then maybe even we get their parents in the room and we have a conversation. I think mm. like there's, there's so much that we can offer as this it's voice to, yeah. of youth and football. And I, I would say, because I, 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 I don't know if I mentioned him in when I was talking about the players that can go past people like there was another one. I don't know if I mentioned him. I might have mentioned him. You did, you did, Oh, you I did. did. That's good. But you know what? I'm probably yeah, gonna, I am probably going to beep out all the names of them all ones right. you said okay. just because I, I think it's we, we shouldn't put them out there. But oh, okay. but um, but what we try to do on, is, Sean, I think, you know, for, for three of us, because we yeah. obviously have a lot of respect for you, you know, with, with how you educated our kids and coaching them. Mm. But it's just if we, it, it, there might be a lot of things that go, well, I don't agree with that. Or oh, this is not what I do. But if it's one little thing that yeah. you can take from it, yeah. That might just help your kid, maybe just to give them a breather, and because it is, it's incredibly stressful. Like I know, I could, I could be sitting here now and say that oh, I've been so laid back, and I, and my dad was really lucky with me because he didn't have to shout at me because I was good and I knew what I had to do and I wanted it, you know, and I just took on board everything he said. Yeah. But there, there are certain like with with my kids at times, like I, I've said things to them and I've actually regretted it so much the next day <laughs> because it's not me as a person. Mm -mm. But it, but and that's me, and I'm pretty mm. laid back. But if I have to maybe see him put the effort in, you know, and I'd look at Boar and I'd see his face and I'd just think, I've said something I can, I don't, I regret so badly. Mm. You know, so I can only imagine what parents have maybe got problems at home. They're finding it hard to put, you know, food on the table. Yeah. And then they also go to a training session, their kid doesn't put it in yeah. and they take it out on them. That's not, that's sometimes it's natural. So don't, you know, it's very easy to go, oh, you shouldn't do that. But people react in so many different ways because we all really just want our kids to do so well. Because no matter what happens, it's what all boils down to your family. And, you know, yeah. you give anything for them to just have a better life than what we've had. We gave the example of Tiger Woods and Andre Agassi. I mean, yeah, obviously great careers. Maybe could there have been a way where they didn't have the breakdown of relationships with the parents and, you know, maybe some of the issues they had later in life if the parents hadn't been so much, so pressurizing when they were young, maybe that's the balance too far. But I think on the whole, in the pursuit of becoming an elite athlete or footballer, there's so much, so many skills that you give your children to deal with life 
gave the example there earlier of like you know removing the phone in the evening so they get a good night's sleep everyone needs that yeah you know, i that... think that's pretty basic you know yeah. you know the other thing is as well with coaches you know you're not allowed to you know or don't tell your, your kid if they've made a mistake now if you if you're not going to you know be able to accept a little bit of criticism or a bit of honesty at times when you play, and I, I was, you know, I then go to play at Anfield in front of fifty-five thousand people, and I give the ball away a couple of times in the first five minutes, and they're on me, the crowd. If I can't handle that, what chance have I got? Yeah. I'll fold. So you've got to be able to take a little bit of honesty and a little bit of criticism now. Hundred percent. You know, otherwise you have absolutely no chance. And, and there, so there are, it, it, there is a, such a fine line that you have to tread as a parent. Yeah. And and as a coach, I think like I, sometimes I watch youth coaches and a kid makes a mistake or they make it again and no one says anything to him. And I I think there is a time and a place where you can say, John. You've given the ball away twice there. That's not good enough. You're costing the team. You know, and if he's going to take that and start tearing up, then he's in the wrong game. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to take a little bit of, you know, a, 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 of um, constructive criticism if you want to be able to handle the correct... Because you've got to remember, fans go out of football, they pay their weight, they, they've, earned, they've earned their wages all week and they go there to voice their opinions. And if a player doesn't, isn't doing what they want to do, they're going to let them know. So yeah. you have to be able to accept a little bit of criticism, be it at 12, 13 years of age. Yeah, yeah. But it has to be done in the right way. Absolutely. Well, even though we've covered so much in this episode, I'm so excited for what we can give out to parents in 2024. Um, it'll be great to have you guys back in. We'll get more episodes coming through in January and we'll reach out to parents and get these questions. But yeah, thank you so much for your time today, guys. Yeah, sure, sure. great conversation. Great stuff, sure. Cool. Yeah. And I could have been a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting that one go, Merce. <laughs>